Set up. Whew. I was running late, so I thought I would just start while I was sanding. Because it usually takes a few minutes for you guys to get on here. So, good morning. My name is Kim. Ooh, I'm knocking over my tripod. And we are working on this chair today. so that it's a little bit quieter and I'll tell you guys what we're gonna do. Welcome. My name is Kim. I teach upholstery workshops. I also do a lot of upholstery tutorials and how-tos here on TikTok. I do lives every Tuesday, so you can join me and see whatever project I'm working on. You can join me, ask questions about what I'm working on, ask questions about your own projects, ask questions about tools, anything you've ever wanted to learn. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm seeing everybody join. So, Today, we're going to be working on this really cool chair, which is part of the New Year New Chair Challenge that I'm doing with Madam of Making. 
and a ton of other posters over on Instagram. You're going to see some promos about that here, but I do encourage you to oh, go over to Instagram and engage on that if you can because it's going to be really cool. There are prizes to be won, Ryobi DIY packages full of tools. Uh, I'm giving away a Furniture Nerd sweatshirt. Like, it, Anything you guys can do to contribute to that campaign will be really cool. It's good for all of us. So today I'm here. We're going to work on this chair that I've already stripped down. I have two of these actually. And we're going to be putting the foam and batting on them. But we also have to start painting them because I need to get the finishing on them finished before I start to put material on it because I don't want to get paint on my fabric. So the first thing we're going to do today is start painting these legs. I do all of this out of my local makerspace. I don't have my own workshop. So I have a membership here at my local makerspace called MakerWorks. I utilize this room not only to come in during the day to work on my projects when I want to, but I also teach my upholstery classes through here and I teach upholstery classes four days a week on Fridays from 6 to 9 p.m. Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Sundays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and Mondays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. so even if you're not local if you want a weekend getaway where you can take like a four-day upholstery weekend you can come visit me and schedule all four classes straight and the cool thing is is all my classes are buy three get one free so you would get that Monday class for free and it's like two 25 for the weekend and I have awesome places that I can connect you with to stay out here if you want to come stay for a weekend but a lot of locals actually benefit from this so I have uh, my classes are limited to about six people and they're typically sold out so it's always good to get signed up on them quickly but the cool thing about this year is last year I did three weekend upholstery retreats locally here that were uh, two of them were sold out the third one we sold half of the tickets and we had a really great time we stayed at a local bed and breakfast and then we had a whole weekend full of uh, eight hour upholstery fundamental <laughs> workshops it was really really cool this year instead of doing that locally I would like to take this on the road and potentially come visit a makerspace near you so I'm already in talks with a handful of maker spaces. Uh, currently, right now, I'm in talks with DIY Cave in um, Bend, Oregon. So if you're from that area, you can give them a call. Let them know that that's something that you're interested in. Help persuade them to sign that contract. If you connect me with a local maker space near you to teach these workshops in, and you're the one that makes that connection, and I end up coming out to do a weekend upholstery camp with you, you'll get to take that that whole weekend course for free with me so if you are interested in bringing this to a town near you I highly suggest you contact your local makerspace if you're not familiar with your local makerspace you can google makerspace near me and it will show you your local makerspace there are over a thousand makerspaces in uh, the United States so chances are you have something relatively close to you I am in Ann Arbor Michigan you can always come and visit me I teach my classes four days a week here but I also do virtual upholstery workshops on Monday nights is my virtual group upholstery workshop. It's a live upholstery workshop where you and up to five other people can join me with your projects from home and I will walk you through step by step how to reupholster it. So if you can't get close to me, you can still take those classes. Right now they're only Monday nights. I'm waiting for interest to pick up. If more interest picks up, we'll add more evenings. I do a lot of stuff on the weekends, so I'm not opposed to doing that, but we need to get the interest picked up before I pick up more days on my schedule. So today we'll work on this chair and I have still yet to set up all of the painting stuff for this chair. So I am going to take you guys on a little bit of a tour of my maker space to show you what it is, what it's all about, all the different tools I have access to. Um, and then you guys can get an idea of what a maker space in your area might look like. Um, so I'm going to wear a harness that actually straps my phone to it. So you get a point of view from like my, from my eyes of what it is that I'm looking at. It makes it a little bit easier for me to do a tour. So give me just one second. Before I go, I will scroll through to see if you guys have any questions. I can't read without my glasses anymore, and that's new for me, so you're probably going to see me fumble with my glasses today. Okay, I'm just going through to see if there's anything. Hi, Curbs the Dude. Thanks for joining. Hi, Minna. Keychords. Dora, thank you guys so much for joining. I'm excited for you to be here. If while you're here, you're learning something or you're just enjoying hanging out with me, you don't have to purchase 
the gifts or whatever I get like fractions of a penny on the dollar for every dollar you purchase on those one thing that does a lot of good for me is if you're just tapping the screen to like it while I'm in here like at the bare minimum you can take a break every time I remind you and just tap the screen violently until that little pink heart shows up in the upper left hand corner and then you it'll be like a meter and goes to the end when it reaches the end it throws you a party so if when I remind you guys to just tap the screen if you can do that while you're doing that this is actually shooting my content out to my or to everyone's for you page people just like you who are interested in this and then they find me and they find my classes and that's how I run my business so you guys are single-handedly saving the upholstery industry by tapping on the screen when I remind you so I am going to flip this camera around and I'm gonna start giving you guys a tour of this really cool maker space in my area. So I am new to this area. Uh, we have been here a year this September. Um, so I don't, <coughs> I didn't, I wasn't aware of this. I was aware of maker spaces in general, but I wasn't aware of this one locally to me. So uh, when we moved at the time, I was teaching virtual upholstery workshops just um, let me grab my coffee while we're doing this. When we moved, I was teaching virtual upholstery workshops in my backyard for you guys because I just closed my business. My husband and I fabricated furniture for about six years in a brick and mortar, and we closed our business a couple years ago, and then we moved out this way. And I wanted to teach as many people upholstery as possible. So I was so excited to find this local makerspace who said that I could rent out this space uh, as part of my membership to teach my upholstery workshops. So it started off with a couple workshops a week and now I'm up to four upholstery workshops a week. I've taught close to 300 people how to do upholstery since last October. Uh, not just past October, but the October before then. And it's been going really well. We have people starting their own businesses. We've done some job placements. Uh, it's been a pretty exciting thing um, to do. So this space that we're in right now is the conference room. And this is sort of like a, a all-purpose classroom. So anyone can rent out this space to work on their project during the day. Anyone can rent this space to uh, teach a class. We have a lot of groups that meet here, like quilting groups, woodworkers guilds, things of that nature. And this space is free for you to use as part of your membership. <clears throat> But it's also, if you're a nonprofit organization or you're holding meetings and not charging people, they allow you to use this for free too. So this is a really, really cool, useful space in this maker space because just about anybody can use it for just about anything and it's really cool. So I'm going to take you through here. And this is kind of where you enter this particular maker space. This is MakerWorks and we're in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We have our shop mascots, Lily and Poppy, who hang out here under the table. So this is where people typically come in. <clears throat> and then the first thing that they do is sign in at the front desk. If you're not a member here, you might be here to take classes um, or to get a private lesson for something or to just get a tour. Uh, but members will sign in. They, If they have specific tools that they're going to use that are tools that need to be reserved, they'll reserve them here. Um, and then we have our computers here. Our computers have all the software from all of the software programming that we teach here at MakerWorks. So there's uh, Fusion 360. There are several CAD programs on here. We have the Adobe Creative Suite is on here, Corel Draw, all the programs that we use to run our 3D printers, our CNC tools, um, their embroidery tools, the lasers, all that kind of cool stuff. So this is sort of the common area, so people might hang out here, work on their designs or computer designs or <clears throat> work on learning software. They teach some classes up here. We have several different types of 3D printers here. So we have two form resin 3D printers, which is where a laser comes down and cures layers of resin at a time, and that comes up from the resin and produces a 3D form. And then we have these filament 3D printers that print from filament, which is probably something you're more familiar with. Through this way is our jewelry studio. This is really cool because we're just starting to develop this out. <coughs> 
it was actually built a while ago, but it doesn't get regularly used, but we just found a maker in residence to help us teach classes and stuff in here. So we've got a CNC mill for the jewelry. We've got presses. We've got grinders. We've got buffers. We've got kilns. We've got uh, this plaster investment station. We have centrifugal wax casting unit. We have uh, pewter sand casting or any kind of sand casting. We have the pewter pot right over here. <coughs> If it can be made at MakerWorks, if it can be made, it can be made at MakerWorks. So this is just a peek at the jewelry studio. We'll come back through the common room. <coughs> What's that? Uh? Oh, so I'm doing, <coughs> this is the electronics area. And I didn't know that you could even do this, but this is our PCB engraver where you can make your own circuit boards. I think I don't 100% understand the whole thing, but it's a really cool area. We have all the books you will need, all the tools that you need to solder, uh, measure, ampage, wattage. I don't really know what I'm talking about in this arena, but it's really cool. And this is uh, a lot of the tools in this area you don't need to reserve. You can just come and work on them as you need them. So coming back through here, in this hallway we have our heat presses, our large format vinyl cutter, there are vinyl materials here like heat transfer and outdoor vinyl, indoor vinyl that you can purchase so you don't have to have your own, you can purchase them here. We have cutting tables here, large format vinyl cutter, and of course more computers that have all of our design programs on them. In this area, we have the lasers. We have laser room B and laser room A. You do have to reserve these tools um, to work off of them, but you only have to take one class to learn how to use it, and then you can come in and use it whenever you like. You just have to remember to reserve it so that they're very popular. Everybody uses them. Coming up in this area is our textiles area. So we have industrial sewing machines. We have Bernina domestic sewing machines. We have everything you would need for fashion design. We have a, a CNC embroidery machine. We also have a Juki serger. We have anything you would need to work on any textiles project. And then this hallway we're about to go through is the uh, we have some of our businesses that lease space here. So you can be a small business and you can actually lease space. A lot of these rooms are used for storage for these businesses, not necessarily like offices, so they keep their projects in there and then they come and they use the space regularly for their business and that's what I do. So I teach my classes out of here and then I use the tools to make my projects and sell them. This is an example of what they kind of look like inside. So coming through this area, and we're only doing this tour so I can go gather my other chair and get it out of the wood shop. We have the rentable storage space for your projects so you don't have to lug your projects back and forth. More business offices. And then in this area is our metal shop. So if you want to weld projects, cut metal, we have a CNC plasma cutter in here. Our welding stations are over this way. This would have been so ideal when my husband and I started our business because he's a metal fabricator and a wood fabricator and I do reupholstery. We would have never had to get a brick and mortar if we had something like this when we started our business and we would have made so much more money. So it's a really, really great community resource. If you have one, consider yourself very lucky. Drill presses, horizontal bandsaw, benders, bandsaws, mills, lathes, anything you could potentially want. We have CNC mills and lathes, manual mills and lathes, shears. We have a sandblasting station and we also have a powder coating, uh, a powder coating booth and oven over here, which is really cool if you're doing metal projects. Coming in through the wood shop, we have a saw stuff, table saw. It's going to get loud. You might not hear me. I'm going to keep talking anyways, but you might not hear what I'm saying. Saw stuff, table saw. Here's the chair I came to get and my sander. And this is the wood shop.
shop, and the wood shop has every tool you could possibly need to work on your wood projects. They have air hoses throughout the space, so you can connect your own air tools, but they also have air tools. We have planers, jointers. My favorite tool is the CNC router, the shapa, drum sanders, all the clamps you could possibly ever need. We also have a router table and a wood lathe. And if you don't know how to use any of these tools, it's not a problem because they have classes to teach you and the staff is always here to help. Drill presses. Really, really cool space. If you're fortunate enough to have one in your area, I highly suggest that you get involved. So I'm going to grab that chair, actually. We're going to take this back to the classroom and get to work on the other chair. get this back set up. Flip this camera around and then I'm going to go through the comments make sure you guys don't have any pressing questions. city are you in? Uh, I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan. You can come to me or I have virtual upholstery workshops. Uh, we can do that online. But I am working on doing a weekend upholstery camp tour this spring and summer. So if you have a local maker space, contact them and let them know that you're interested in me teaching classes there. If you connect me with that maker space, you will get to take those that weekend retreat for free. I'm new to glasses, you guys. So forgive me. I'm trying to read. This is a dream. Would love this in my area. Yeah, maker spaces are so cool. And uh, this particular maker space, the top tier membership fee is $220 a month. And that's insane if you are doing stuff to make money, especially if you're making and selling furniture. So if you're uh, restoring wood or things of that nature, everything you need, like woodworking tools, metalworking tools, everything you need is here. And if you're using all of these tools, this giant, this is a 14,000 square foot workshop. Shop. This isn't even one of the biggest in the, in the United States. So it's got all the space and all the tools you need to work on your project. And if your overhead is $220 a month, like that's insane. It's a it's such a valuable resource. It's really, really cool. Good morning to everyone joining. Good morning. How are you? I love that job. I'm experiencing 35 years. I'm at this, our teacher. Good morning. Thanks so much. Yeah, upholstery is especially learning it. There are a few options in the United States, like maybe about a dozen options in the United States. And so uh, now that the upholstery, everyone in the upholstery industry is sort of aging out, there's no one left to sort of pass on that education. So I'm trying to teach as many as possible. Is there any on Miami Beach? I'm not sure. I know there's a lot in Florida, but I'm not sure where they are located. Just you do it or order a designer. So I actually, I was, uh, I had my own fabrication business for in a brick and mortar for six years with my husband. We worked with designers, architects, contractors, residential clients. Uh, we uh, designed a lot of our own stuff or we would reupholster stuff. So we fabri designed, fabricated, and um, re restored furniture. It was a lot of fun. Okay, so what we're going to start with today on this chair is painting these legs 
gold so I use um, what's the name of the place again this place is called maker works it's a community maker space so if you're looking for something near you I would google maker space near me there's several databases out there that will show up as like the first options that have all of the maker spaces that exist listed and it'll even some of them even show you if they've been closed because unfortunately a lot of these maker spaces struggle because it's hard to keep members especially after COVID uh, during that shutdown during that time these maker spaces couldn't be utilized by their members so they lost a lot of money during that time so anything you can do to support your local maker space particularly if they're a nonprofit organization who is doing a lot to benefit the community then I would suggest you look for something near you <clears throat> okay so I have got to get my paint ready which I have this I use what's called an underpainting technique to, to paint all of my pieces. So I just layer different colors of paint on top. The goal with these chairs is to have them look white on the appearance on the outside. I always do a base coat of some sort. In this case, I'm doing a base coat of gold so that uh, when, as I start to buff out everything as I paint it on, you'll see the gold in any of the carved details, in any of the nicks and scratches that are there, and in any of the areas that like are faded away. The technique that I use to put this on is like I wipe the paint on and then I wipe it off, and then I let that layer dry, and I wipe the paint on, and I wipe it off and let that layer dry. We're starting with gold, which is just going to be a solid finish, but we're going to be putting an off-white color on top of that, and so that is just sort of going to create as you wipe it on and off it creates like a vignette and it builds up color on the layers it allows the paint to dry faster and makes it more strong uh, and I really like the technique it sort of makes it look like it's already antiqued I don't enjoy sanding paint off to make it look like rustic or used or antiqued but I do like to build up that finish but I'm an art major and that's what I did in, in college so uh, that having nothing to do with furniture at all you need people to experience working in this company. I'm trying to find a job now. In the United States, there is no shortage of jobs for upholsterers because um, everyone who still has a business out here right now is experiencing the highest demand we've ever experienced. A lot of the upholstery, local upholstery places out here, their waiting lists are about a year out. So uh, it's really difficult to get in line to these upholstery places, which is why I'm teaching upholstery. I'm trying to teach as many people as I can. A lot of my students take on clients from their homes. I also do a sponsored student project where people who are looking for upholstery services can pay for the cost of classes and materials and then my students will do the work for them. So we're doing a lot out here to help bridge that gap um, of sustainability for small businesses as well as trying to get people trained so that they can take on jobs like these two. Ever since um, uh, COVID, the supply chain has been disrupted and it's making it difficult not to just get supplies and materials overseas but to get custom-made furniture or furniture that you would purchase online, everything that is sort of manufactured and mass-produced overseas, it's difficult to get over here now because of the supply chain demands, because of the wars overseas. So now it is just as difficult to order something online for cheap as it is to hire someone local to do your upholstery, but there's just not enough upholsters to take on the work. So the resale industry has gone up uh, to 16.9 plus billion dollars since 2021, since COVID happened. So the it's a really good time to get in on doing stuff like this, to pull in a little bit of extra cash on the side. You're, there's never gonna not be a need for upholstery. People are always gonna want furniture whether you're doing it cheaply or whether you're charging a ton of money for it you're always gonna have a job in it the second you pick up a pair of staple removers everyone's going to be asking you to do upholstery for them I promise you <coughs> okay so I'm going to get started painting this now I'm shaking this for a minute I'm gonna do this technique uh, with a wipe on method you, you can I think people call it the sock method but I'm gonna use a microfiber cloth which I'm gonna dampen with some water and then I'm gonna dip into the paint and then I'm just going to wipe it on I sanded these legs down completely 
You don't need to sand the legs down completely to do this, but this had a cherry stain on it, um, and some of that sometimes that can tend to bleed through. You can put shellac on it if you don't want that to bleed through. I didn't want to do that step, and when I started sanding it, it came off very easily. So I just sanded it completely down. So now it's nice and smooth and slick and looking good, and I can turn this around while I get my materials together and we can start focusing on the painting aspect of this. Oh, I'm actually, I want to see you guys the way you see me, so I'm flipping this back around. We'll start from back here and then I'll zoom in on parts too so you can see it. So, whenever I'm painting a piece of furniture, I start bottoms up. And that's because you're always missing stuff in the back and behind and under things when it's top down like this. Plus, sometimes if you're painting the whole piece, you don't want to scrape the top part by flipping it to get to the bottom part. So, if you start from the bottom and work your way to the top, you're going to have less damage as you go. I have a lot of stuff going on. So we're going to start painting this from the bottom up. For this project, I need gloves. Gloves, my paint, and we're going to need some water. And uh, I also use a microfiber cloth, so we'll be right back with that. But I'm going to show you guys how to get, uh, effectively get like a beautifully smooth, silky, glossy finish um, without any streaks or anything in it. So that's what we're working on. So this paint right here is just an acrylic paint. It's a craft paint. I, I like to use spray paint typically as my base coat. Um, which people will tell you don't mix oil and water, but if you're painting things the right way, you can manipulate all of these mediums to work with each other. So not all rules are hard, fast rules. This is an acrylic paint, and what we're going to do is we're going to put this on in as thin a coat as, as possible so that we get a streak-free finish. When you touch the finish when it's done, especially because we're applying it with microfiber cloth as we go, it buffs everything out as go. It's like silky, silky smooth. So it might, like... Uh, it looks textured a little bit the way you put it on because it's layered colors, but it is so silky smooth to the touch. There's no streaks, there's no gunk, There's it's just really, really cool smooth finish. So, I'm going to get this going. I'm wearing gloves so that I don't get paint in my hands. If you don't care about that, then don't worry about this. Coffee, handy, just in case. 
So, the first thing I want to do is sort of make this small because I don't want this um, microfiber cloth dragging, particularly these hard edges right here can drag on your finish and then it'll put like streaks or creases in it or cracks and I don't like that so I fold this up to a small bit. You don't have to use a paintbrush to get a smoky, silky smooth finish. This is going to um, this is going to buff your piece as you go. That cat hurts my soul. I'm not sure what that means. So I'm going to get this wet first. on my paint and then I'm just gonna start smoothing this up so I'm gonna get this around oh the microfiber catch on the wood yes that can that can hurt your soul these are nice and sanded with a 120 almost all the way down I look like, like I missed one side of the leg it doesn't have to be sanded down to the wood to get a really good finish uh, but this came off easy so I just kept going this is kind of cool to watch it always finds the tiny pieces yeah it does oh no I think my gold paint bomber, my gold paint is not any good anymore. All the water is in there, everything else is dried out. That's really sad. So we're not painting today. We're gonna move right on to putting foam and batting on this chair. That's less boring than watching paint dry, literally, anyway, so. <clears throat> okay, paints. Not happening today, but it's got to happen before the fabric gets on. Let me put this away. Cheer back up. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do to start covering this chair is we have to cover up the springs. You want to cover up the springs with a barrier fabric because if you don't, it's literally going to cut right through the foam over time. So it's very important to cover these up. We're going to use a synthetic burlap to cover this up. You can use a regular burlap. You can use a heavy duty upholstery scrap fabric or a piece of leather or vinyl or anything sort of heavy duty. It's just a barrier between the foam and the fabric. So it doesn't really matter what it looks like if you are interested and concerned about sustainable materials using scrap materials is perfectly fine to do something like this just make sure it's kind of a medium to heavyweight fabric so that it can sustain the use of time um, and so i'm going to take you over to the table so that we can start cutting that set this up here and i'm going to shut a couple doors Also, we're not ready for this. <clears throat> okay, so this particular piece of fabric is going to get stapled down to this top edge of the frame. So the top surface of all the edges of the frame. This chair is squared in the front and rounded in the back. Ignore that, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if there's a curve in the back. The piece of material that you're cutting for this seat is going to be a rectangle, a rectangle or a square, but something very square edged. So what I need to do is measure from the back to the front at its widest point. In this chair's case is the center because it gets more narrow at the sides where it curves. So I'm gonna measure from the back to the front for that length and then I'm going to measure the widest point in the front from side to side. The widest point on this chair is in the front because it's rounded and more narrow in the back. So the longest point is going to be in the middle here and the widest point is going to be at the front here. Now, typically I always tell my students don't reuse your patterns for your chairs when you go back to do it because one, that furniture or that piece of furniture has been used so that fabric has been stretched out. You're going to be putting new materials on it so it's going to be bigger and fluffier, hopefully a better shape than it was when you took the fabric off. So it's not 100% reliable. So if you learn to make your patterns from the get, you're going to have a much easier time learning how to do upholstery. In this year's case, this is what I like to call a wrap and staple. Every single piece 
that goes on this chair is a rectangle shape. It's wrapped and it's stapled into place. I doesn't need, I don't even need to sew anything to get it finished. So this is a really, really easy piece to get started with. When I'm doing, also the other thing to think about is when uh, you're taking the material off of the furniture, it's gonna be too small to put back on when you have like thicker, bulkier materials. Plus you might even cut some off or it might rip, so it's just not gonna be as useful as you think it is. In order for me to be able to hold on to this, because I have carpal tunnel and I can't like pinch everything, I need a certain amount of fabric added onto that measurement so that I can hold it. So you're going to need to cut more than the exact distance from the front to the back. You're going to need to add some additional material so that you can hold it on either side as you go to apply it, because you need to be able to pull it a little bit to make it taut. For me, that's two inches. So I will add two inches to the back and two inches to the front so that I can hold it on either side, which adds four inches to my overall measurement. So I'm going to measure from here to here, add four inches, and then the widest point in the front and add four inches, and that is what I'm going to cut my piece of burlap at. So from here to here is 22, 24 inches all together with the four inches added. So we have 24 inches by... 29 inches so 24 by 29 is what we have to count and I'm counting on you guys to remember that from here to the table because I'll probably get to forget 24 by 29 let me grab my ruler and let me grab a piece of chalk barrier material that I'm putting over top of the surface. It doesn't have to be synthetic burlap. This is professional poster material. This you can get on my website. Uh, you can get regular burlap too. This is what I use, uh, but if I do have scrap materials handy, I typically will use those because it's cheaper than this uh, and better for the environment. So I'm going to just kind of spread this out. I, don't, I need a Sharpie, not a white chalk pencil because this is too light. So I do remember the measurements, 24 by 29. I'm going to use my T-square to do this measurement. Fabric is uh, a finicky beast, and it's really hard to get it perfectly square. But the only time you really want to worry about getting precise measurements is when you're sewing something, because you have to add a seam allowance to it. And when you're sewing something, it's tailored to fit whatever it is you're sewing it to. For the purposes of putting this as a barrier on the deck of my seat, it doesn't have to be 100% perfect. So, Thank you for 
put in 24 by 29 in the comment section. I appreciate it. Upholstery takes a, it seems like upholstery takes a lot of special equipment. How do I get started? Upholstery doesn't take a lot of special equipment, but the special equipment does make your job a lot easier. The only thing you need to get started doing upholstery is a staple remover, a pair of scissors, a needle, and thread. And then, of course, whatever material you're going to put on top of it. I suggest when you're practicing, always reuse the material if you can. Buy new fabric, but reuse the foam and material if it's in good shape because you're practicing and that material gets expensive. And so when you're practicing and you're learning and you're ruining this material, it can not only be devastating to you, but it can really dig into you financially and set you back so that it's not as easy or accessible to pick this up as a new skill. So I suggest um, you practice on things. Don't worry about being perfect right away get all of your like, the hand motions and routines and stuff down and then start worrying about procuring like brand new materials to, uh, to work on but <clears throat> really a stapler a staple remover um, hammer nails scissors needle thread that's really all you need to get started but having pneumatic air tools and having specialized staple removers uh, things of that nature make the job easier so it makes it an easier thing to get into and helps you learn a lot better because it is highly impactful on your body uh, a lot of older upholsters have arthritis or carpal tunnel in the hands I have carpal tunnel but I had that before I started doing upholstery so it is really difficult and taxing on your body so having pneumatic tools or automatic tools is better Staple gun, staple remover, good. See, yeah, that's what somebody knows. I have a couch I've been saving and hoping to redo it. A couch is just a really wide chair, so get started on a chair. A wing back is the best thing to get started with because it's kind of like any other piece of furniture you would see. You can do just about any fundamental on it, and you learn just about every fundamental on it. And anything you learn on a wing back can be applied to another piece of fabric. Dingum air compressor. Yes, it's loud, but that might be the only time that it goes off over here, which is good. <clears throat> okay, now we're ready. Okay, so a T-square is a good thing to have to help you keep your fabric as square as possible. When you're just cutting out rectangles to put on the piece and you're going to be cutting off all the excess, your measurement doesn't have to be perfect, but you need to get in the habit of being able to measure perfectly. And fabric can make it difficult because it moves and it's flexible and it's stretchy. This has a factory edge that's pretty straight, so I'm going to start my base measurements off of that factory edge, and I believe it says 29 by 24 on there, so I'm going to start there. This is the square edge of my tool, so I'm going to align that with the straight edge, the factory edge up here, and on this very far edge is where I'm going to start my first measurement. I could square this off right now so that I can measure from this point in this direction and it's perfect, but I just need a roundabout measurement and so I don't mind that it's like this, but when I go to cut it, it'll be squared on that side. So 29 by 24, this is 34 inches and in order to conserve material, I'm going to take that longer measurement, 29, in this direction so that I take less material off this way. So on my ruler, and I don't know if it's like this on every ruler, but probably if it looks like this, it starts with a 1 on one side and a 48 on the other. So that you can use either end of this ruler, whatever direction you have it. So be mindful of what side you're looking at when you put your measurements on here, because I have very often confused sides and put the wrong measurement and ended up making it smaller than I needed to, which was a nightmare when you're spending 250 bucks a yard on fabric. So I'm going to take my 29 inch measurement this way and then I'm just going to bring this down just a little bit, estimated 24 inches, square it off at the top and mark it at 29 inches just a little bit further down. Now I can use these two dots uh, and line them up and make my mark this way. So I am going to, I don't need the square edge for this because I have the marks already made. So I'm going to use this end of the ruler and I'm going to leave that at 24 inches. So I'm connecting these two dots. I'm putting it up at 24 inches on this side and then I'm just going to draw that line and mark it on this end. So now I need to mark 24 inches from this side. And 
and then I can connect these two dots. And if everything is squared, this should line up flush with that straight edge when you connect these two dots, and it does do that. So I'm excited. I've officially squared off this edge without wasting any material. So now I'm just going to cut this out with my fabric scissors. Take it back over to the chair and we can put it on there. Gonna need these. This is gonna go here. Let me get this up high so that I can point this down on the seat so you guys can see a little bit better here. So this material has to be applied to the seat deck and it's going to get stapled directly to the surface of this frame, the very top of this frame. And I need it to not go over top. We're not wrapping in it, we're not folding it, we're just going to staple it to the top of the frame. The trouble is, is I have these legs that make it very difficult for me to tuck this through. So these clearances right here between the arm uh, part, the arm part of the frame, the back leg here, right here, this back leg right here. These are what I like to refer to as pull through spots. This is where your fabric pulls through. These are clearances for fabric. So we're going to put this on and make cuts so that the fabric can get around these barriers here on the side and still lay flat cleanly on this seat. So the first thing I'm going to do is apply it to the seat. Since I know I'm going to be cutting off the excess, I'm going to line it up here in the front flush with this. I am going to fold this back one and staple it just so that it has a little bit of extra added assurance that it's not going to pull out. So I want it to come out a little bit proud of the frame. And then I'm just going to press everything into place. Now, you're going to be tempted at this stage to tuck everything between these holes and to start stapling stuff right away, but I want you to stop yourself. The worst part of upholstery is removing staples, so at this stage what I want us to do is we're going to first evenly distribute this material across the surface by locking it down in the center here and locking it down in the center here so that we have enough material on each side. This way it's not going to move before we make our cuts. So we're going to lock these two down first, make our cuts, push everything through, and lock it down in the center that way so we have it evenly stretched and distributed across the surface. If you were to start stapling it here and going around in a circle and stapling it here, your material tends to shift. And when it shifts, it shears, and it gets these wrinkles in it. And you don't want wrinkles in your upholstery project. So I spent years and years and years learning the best like tips and tricks to get the cleanest work possible and this is the best advice that I can give you is first evenly distribute the fabric and worry about throwing in all your staples last. So two staples we're going to put in here, one in the front and one in the back. So one in the middle and the front. I, I always tell people you're doing centers. So centers in the middle and the front and centers on the side. So the first two, one in the center here. If you're nervous about applying fabric at this stage, a couple of things for you to consider. One, this is your practice layer of fabric. This is gonna get covered up by a bunch of other layers. If it's not perfect, it doesn't matter because nobody's gonna see it. So don't be so hard on yourself. <clears throat> and two, you can use what I call a temporary staple so that you can easily remove it if you're like nervous about it being placed in the wrong place. And the way to do that is instead of stapling flat down, tip your stapler to the side and staple and there'll be a gap right underneath that staple so that you can get your staple removal under there easily without damaging the fabric and remove it much easier. So you don't have to go to town on staples right now and you don't have to put the staples in all the way. So this will tuck back from back to front in just the middle because there's no barrier in the back. So I can put it in the back and I want to pull it nice and taut 
so that I can put a staple in the middle and the back. And now I say taut and not too tight because if you pull this too tight and someone sits on it, it can tear away from the staples if there's no stretch. So the goal is to not pull it tight like a drum. The goal is to pull it taut. So you're pulling it to just, just when it starts to give a little bit of a stretch and then you're gonna put a staple. You don't want it to be loose. You don't wanna be able to like pinch it or like move the fabric around when you rub it when it's done because it's only gonna get looser over time. But you do want it to be nice and taut without being too tight. So now I have the centers marked. We're going to mark for these cuts to get around these legs. So because we did the middle here, I wanna work on these arms and these back legs so that I can get the centers down in the sides. I'm gonna get a little bit closer to the action for that for you guys. Now this particular layer is cut the same way that every layer that goes on after this is cut. So this is a really great practice layer for you to start working on getting these cuts right. So that's what we're doing here today. So I have this barrier where this piece of fabric can't tuck through. If I tuck it through here, it's going to buckle there. If I bring it there, it's going to buckle around that side. This fabric needs to be relieved so that the fabric can go through the frame like it's intended. So I want to sort of pull a little bit taut from the center. It shouldn't be moving back and forth because we locked it down in the center and the front and the sides. And I'm just going to fold this back so that the fold touches this part of the arm right here, this part of the frame. It's folded flat up against that. If this were on an angle this way, you would want to fold it flat up against that angle. But this is pretty, this is the broad side of it. It's going to get folded flat up against there. It's always good. I don't use a Sharpie for this anymore when I'm doing this on my own. I only show people because it's a visual aid. But um, you can use Sharpie or chalk to mark this before you go nuts cutting it if it makes you nervous. Sharpie is good if it's not going to bleed through the fabric. So what we need to do is make a cut, not just so that this can go through here and come out the other side this way, but so that if it goes around this leg, it can actually meet on the other side. For this chair, it doesn't have to meet on the other side because the side is gonna get covered up, but it's a good habit to get into the practice of making this cut in the event that you do need that fabric to overlap on the other side. So this is what we call a Y cut. And the Y cut is a line that goes straight for the center of this barrier. In this case, it's an arm. So we're just gonna keep referring it to, to it as an arm. So the line goes straight for the center of the arm. And then I'm going to put two fingers next to the arm and make a little dot on the other side. This measurement is arbitrary, but I have two fingers on me at all, all times, so it is why I use two fingers. But you can just start at any point up this line that is a, an inch or so away from the arm. So I do the two finger rule, make a dot. The next thing I want to do is make a line that goes from this dot to the outside corner of this arm. I don't want it to go outside of the arm because if I do, there's gonna be a gap in between the, the material and the edge of the arm. I want it to go just inside the arm. So I'm gonna make a line from here to the corner of this arm. And I'm gonna do the same thing to the other side of the arm, from here to the corner. So what I'm gonna do is cut up this center line and then out here in the shape of a Y and I'll show you what happens after I do that. Let me get this a little closer so you guys can see. Okay. So the first cut goes straight for the middle of the arm. And then right about two finger widths away from the arm, we're going to go angle towards this edge, not outside the arm, but just inside of it. And then we're gonna cut an angle towards this edge. This is typically the trickiest part people learn about upholstery is how to cut your fabric so that it can go around these barriers and still look clean. I'm taking this cut all the way up to the wood. All the way up to where it folds. And now this little part of the Y will tuck down in 
which will leave a clean edge around this arm. And this part can go in this direction. See how there's too much material here? This is where this folds under and creates a clean line up against that arm. And then this will tuck through the same way and fold under that way. Now, if this were a chair where you could see the sides of the upholstery. This comes through this side, also creates a clean line, and then these two materials can overlap on this side covering up this area. We don't need it to do that because we're gonna trim all of this off, but that's why you would wanna make a cut like that so that your material can come back around and meet itself on the other side. Now our cuts in the back look just a little bit different, but it's only because that leg is on an angle. And we talked about that a little bit already. So I'm gonna pull this up a little bit so you can get more of it on top. So we have these back legs here. Whenever you're coming to the broad side of a leg or the broad side of a piece of your frame, you want that fold to be folded up to that broad side. In this case, this back leg's on an angle, so this fabric looks like it's doggy eared here in the back. So this still gets a Y cut, we just have the fold is now on an angle because that leg is on an angle. So I'm gonna do this Y cut without making those marks to see if you can guys can understand. So I'm taking the first cut straight to the middle of this leg. And then about two finger widths away or before, I'm gonna stop and then I'm going to take my Y right for the outside edge of that leg and right for the inside edge of that leg. But just inside the corner. Now I don't wanna go outside because if I go outside, there'll be a gap in the material. So now I have the little Y part will get tucked in around that leg and then this can continue through the side and get pulled this way and this is ready to get touched through the center and creates a nice clean surface on top and this is folded right around that leg so if this were show fabric and this were show wood this would look nice and clean right here so this is your first practice layer to get these cuts right and it's really it's really good you get a lot of these layers before you have to knuckle down and cut into your show fabric so we're going to do the same thing on this side folding it and i'm also like pulling my material this way because it's going to be stretched a little taut that way and folding it right up along the broad side edge of this barrier of this frame so this gets cut we can make our marks again for anyone just jumping through. So we are doing a Y cut up to this leg. First, we wanna make a line that goes straight to the center of the leg, right to the outside of that fabric. I use two fingers as an arbitrary measurement because I have them on me at all times, and I make a dot on that line. From this dot, I'm gonna draw a line from the dot to the corner of the leg here. And then from this dot, I'm going to draw a line from the dot to the corner of the leg on the inside here. And then I'm going to cut up this line and then into this Y shape to do what we just did to the other cuts, to get this fabric to go through the frame properly and cleanly. So we're going to cut right up the middle, stop at that little dot, and then we're going to cut right up that Y and we're going to stop at the wood. We don't want our cut to go on the outside of this leg because there'll be a gap between the fabric and the leg, but we do want it to go just inside of it, not too far inside, like maybe a sixteenth of an inch. So I'm gonna make this second part of the Y cut all the way up to the wood. And now this little part of the Y tucks down and makes a clean line in front of this part of the leg. This part comes over and there's extra fabric here, so this actually gets folded under so that it cleans up in front of the leg there too. So this can come up front, and this can come right through the sides. And now we just have one last cut to do here in the back, and then we're ready to lock everything down.
And after I finish this cut, I'm going to answer your guys' questions. So if you have any questions about this or anything else, put them in the comment section and I'm gonna read through them here in just a minute. So this is doggy eared again, up against the angle of this leg because it's at an angle. So I want my line to go straight to the center of that leg, two fingers in front, and then I'm making a Y to one side of this leg on the outside and then one side of this leg on the inside and that's going to be my cut. It's a very simple cut that I stressed out about for years before I perfected it and now I don't get nervous when I make it anymore and I didn't think that that would ever be possible. So off to this part of the leg and then we are off to finish off that Y to the far side of that leg over here and that cut goes right up to the wood. So now the Y can tuck in front of the leg and then these pieces tuck through the frame. And I just want to show you again how this cleanly folds. So we'll do every leg while we're here around these legs. So there's a little bit of extra material on all three of these sides of the leg that can get folded in to create a clean look around here. Now this is a barrier. It doesn't matter if this is folded cleanly or not. But the cleaner your work, the more clean it's going to look when it's done and it'll be beautiful and stunning for that reason because it's clean. Okay, so we have these legs too. There's a little bit of extra fabric that comes up on both sides, that extra just gets folded in so that it creates a nice clean edge against that leg. Now, if your fabric is still wrinkling up in front of that leg, what that means is that it can just be cut a little bit more. So we're doing that to all the legs and now I can start adding more staples. So I've already added staples to the front center and the back center here to stretch us across the front so it didn't move before we made our cuts so that we make sure our cuts stay in the place that they're supposed to. The next step is I'm going to be putting a staple in the middle sides here. And then I'm gonna answer your questions after that's locked down. So I'm pulling this nice and taut. Now's a good time to check your cut areas to see if they're buckling in any way. And this actually is buckling, I'll show you on this side. Whenever the fabric buckles around one of these pieces, it means that it needs to be relieved. You need to make a relief cut in order for that wrinkle to go away. So when I pull this way, it's buckling up around here, which means that there's just more room to cut. So I will untuck my fabric from this area. If you don't untuck it, you can't clearly see it. Because I pulled everything over a little bit tighter, that makes sense to lock it down. Refold it up in front of that frame and then I'm just gonna make my cuts a little bit longer so that that can be pulled closer to the frame. When I make these cuts, I don't wanna continue to go in the Y. I wanna continue to go straight down for that leg because I need it to fold up along that side and there can't be a gap. So the, the cut just continues to go straight there. And we'll do the same thing on this side. Retuck that. Push everything back. And pull that nice and taut. And now that, that little bubble has gone away. So my next staple is going to be up here in the corner. And we'll put one down here by the fold so that doesn't go away. And up here in the corner. I want to see this far enough back so that when I fold this up it doesn't stick outside of the frame. You don't want any material to stick outside the frame because you'll see it when you put your upholstery fabric on it. All right, I'm going to read these questions and then we'll finish the rest of the seat. Okay, 
I do marine upholstery and some RV cushions, but I'm still new and interested in furniture too. It is applicable. So I think that marine and auto upholstery is way harder than soft furnishings upholstery. So it's all applicable. I hope you stick to it. I do these on Tuesdays for free. I also teach virtual upholstery workshops, in-person workshops, and upholstery camps, which I'm doing on tour this spring and summer. So maybe I'll come to a space near, near you. I'm looking for maker spaces uh, across the United States interested in hosting me because that's where I teach my classes here and it benefits them very much when I do that. So I'm looking for local maker space. If you have a maker space near you and you want to see me come out there this spring and summer to teach some weekend upholstery workshops, contact them. Send them to the weekend upholstery camp link in my bio. If you're the one who makes the connection with me and that maker space and I end up coming out there, you can attend the weekend retreat for free. It looks so clean. Yes, it does. So that's the secret. That's the secret to making cuts on the material. What is the name of that material? This material is a synthetic burlap. Is synthetic burlap required? Would love to use non-synthetic fabrics if possible. It absolutely isn't. This is a barrier fabric that is used to cover up the springs so that the springs don't cut through the foam. You can use just about any type of fabric is a barrier fabric so long as it's like heavy duty enough to withstand the everybody sitting on it so you're thinking hundreds of pounds of people over the course of like 20 30 years um a heavy duty like uh canvas or scrap upholstery fabric medium weight to heavy duty fabric works regular burlap works hemp burlap works you can get that at joanne fabrics now too you can reuse materials you do not have to use synthetic burlap do you make new chairs or only reupholster old ones with new fabrics? Uh, I do both new and old fabrications. So my husband and I had our own fab shop for six years where we designed and made our own custom furniture and fixture fabrications for designers, architects, and contractors for commercial spaces and uh, residential spaces. But we also restore old furniture. I don't run my business anymore because uh, after six years of working seven days a week, 15 hour days, and not being able to hire anyone because nobody knows how to do this, we burn out and I just couldn't do it anymore. So I am teaching people how to do upholstery, teach as many people as possible because the demand for upholstery is so high. There's not enough trained, skilled people out here to do it and more people need to take it on so that they can learn how to do it, make money doing it and take the strain and stress off of the existing businesses because a lot of the people in existing businesses are aging out of the business um, and they can't do it anymore or they're weightless are over a year long and so they have to wait a long time in between projects before they get paid for anything and it's just not sustainable to run businesses this way we need more uh, trained skilled tradespeople and there's not a lot of formal opportunities in the United States to do this so I have this DIY approach because I am self-taught uh, there's no formal options for education in this area for me so when I started teaching myself how to do this I wanted to teach as many people how to do this as I could there's a big maker space in Dallas. Call them up. I'd love to go to Dallas. That's really cool. You do weekend retreats. Yeah, last year we did weekend retreats here locally, and we did the classes here at this maker space that I work out of, and then we did the weekend stay at a local bed and breakfast, uh, which was at the Newton of Ypsilanti, which is a historic mansion in Ypsilanti, Michigan, just outside of Ann Arbor. So this is like two miles away from the maker space we were doing our classes. They had chef prepared meals. We stayed there four nights five days we had breakfasts lunches uh dinners snacks like it was incredible it was a really fun experience we sold out we had three upholstery camps out here last year uh eat they were like 1500 bucks a pop it was insane but the ones that i'm bringing to you to make our spaces near you i want to be as accessible as possible so we're trying to keep them under a thousand dollars so people can attend the weekend but there may not be as many fun bells and whistles as before but the important thing is, is we will be hanging out the weekend together doing a Upholstery, which is what it's all about. Do you have to worry about putting too many nails and staples and holes in the wood? You absolutely do. A lot of antique upholstery, especially if it's been reupholstered more than once, the frame is not in great shape, especially if they're using upholstery tacks as, uh, as a method of attaching the fabric because it leaves deeper holes. So there is a finite number of times that a piece of furniture can be reupholstered. Everyone always asks, do you have to take out all the staples and nails in order to redo it? And the short answer is yes, because of there's a finite number of nails and staples that can be put in a frame. But the other answer is uh, 
it can bulk up those areas and it can look like garbage underneath and the more material you put in a wood frame the more the wood comes apart and then it starts to break apart and then it's not as functional as it used to be so you do have to worry about putting too many holes I know how hire me I love it I would love to hire you but I don't have my business anymore I closed it but I am trying to train people so that maybe one day I can get back to doing that my dream of upholstery is to own like a tattoo shop but like for furniture where people can come in and they can pick a piece off the wall they can pick their fabric they can pick their artist and then that person will make it for them and I want to have like a team of really cool chicks that does that and so that's what I'm looking to get back to one day so I'm training people to do it uh, I'm trying to earn a living doing just upholstery education so that I can put my full-time effort into making that dream a reality one day can you make a living in reupholster business? You absolutely can, and especially if you're smart about it. One of the dumbest things that I did when my husband and I started our business was leave our home and go to a brick and mortar because it was just him and I, and we were taking on big jobs that only him and I could do. We didn't have anyone to help, so they would take a long time, which would be a long time between getting paid between jobs. Um, and we had no shortage of jobs. We were busy. We had year-long wait lists, uh, but all of our money ended up going into our overhead. If we would have stayed at our garage or if we would have known we could access a makerspace like the one I have here we would have never left our house and we could have made a lot more profit I also suggest if you get into the business of doing this that you take it take on a one in one out philosophy which means you take in a project finish it get it out the door and then take on another one don't get a wait list because every time you back up a project everything in that wait list gets backed up and you start to upset customers if you do one in one out you're gonna pull a project in you won't get paid till it's finished so you're gonna be motivated to finish it faster you're gonna have shorter wait times and you're gonna create a demand for yourself so I would suggest don't have a wait list but have a mailing list so when you finish a project you email that mailing list and you're like I'm done I have room and first come first serve people are gonna race down <laughs> to have you work on their project for them so that's my suggestion stay home find a local makerspace because the overhead of a membership in a makerspace is much lower than the overhead of a brick and mortar and you have access to top of the line tools here I have a CNC router a CNC plasma cutter embroidery machines sergers industrial sewing machines I don't have to own any of these tools I pay 220 bucks a month to come in here and use them whenever I want so having access to a local maker space is a really good way to get started in this business the second you pick up a staple remover everyone in your life is going to ask you if you will reupholster something for them mention that you're going to try reupholstery and everyone you know is gonna be like I have lots of work for you it's there's a high demand for it and there's not enough skilled trades people out to take on that demand I was doing dining room seats at 175 bucks a pop that's just the wrap and staple seat you don't even have to have the chair at your house you just take the seat wrap it staple it give it back it's a really fast easy way to make money and people get those changed up all the time we have a months long waiting list and get asked all the time about furniture yeah it's a uh, it's in high demand and the people who are in in the industry in the United States can't take it on by themselves because there's just too much of it ever since COVID happening happened and it made it difficult to order online and get stuff mass produced from overseas uh, the resale industry reupholstery industry uh, development industry everything has gone way up so the demand for it is higher than it was before and it's more difficult for people to get furniture by ordering it online or even going to Ashley Furniture. They don't make those mass production anymore. They make them on demand. So if you order a piece from Ashley Furniture or Love's Furniture or whatever, it's going to be six months to a year before you get it because they have to manually produce it. They don't do the mass production anymore. My next project is my couch. Fantastic. A couch is just an oversized chair. Where are you located? I am in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I just finished my king size bed. I'd love to see it. I'm on Facebook and Instagram too. Uh, we have a, a private group on Facebook called the Loco Upholstery Club. So you can actually join the Loco Upholstery Club if you're working on projects from home and you get stuck. You can tag me, but there are, are a variety of people with a variety of levels of experiences in that club from looky loose to people who've been doing upholstery 50 years. And it's a hyper supportive group if you're just getting into learning this skill. There's no judgment. Nobody cares if you did it wrong. Nobody cares that you're teaching yourself we're all there to support you because we know how important it is to have you and welcome you into the industry so you're not going to get that like we're better than you attitude out of that group it's a really really great supportive place 
what is the best way to begin in this craft and be successful? I'm looking for a next phase, no job. So the best way to get into this craft is to get started and get practicing. I started by pulling furniture out of the trash and restoring it. And all along the way, I was just taking pictures and posting it on my personal Facebook page where all my friends and family were like, oh my God, you do upholstery, I have so many jobs for you. Uh, and it was before I even knew how to do anything. The first year of learning upholstery, I was already working with designers who knew that I was new and practicing, who helped give me jobs that would help me learn things effectively until I was really, really good at it. And then I was making furniture and fixtures for restaurants, uh, uh, high rises, uh, like rich residential areas. There's no shortage of it. So the best way to get started in it is to practice. Pull stuff out of the trash, restore things, conserve materials in the beginning when you can because you don't want to put a ton of money into this until you're making money from it but I promise you you'll be making money within the first couple of months even before you know what you're doing because everyone you know is gonna be like I want to help you learn because they know how much cheaper it is to get someone who's learning to do it for them than it is to hire someone to do it what is the best way to price work when you're new so the best way to price work when you're new is to, this is how I do it, this is my formula. The, your hourly rate, how much you charge for your time, your cost of materials, and then I add 20% to that total uh, for incidentals because there's always incidentals. The, your hourly rate is going to be based on how much money you need to make to survive. And the way that I figure my hourly rate is that the cost of my living expenses and every expense that I have, my business expenses, my living expenses, times two. Because not only do I need to make enough money to pay off those expenses, but I need to make enough money to profit off of it as well. So in the beginning, we were charging $30 an hour. At the end, we were charging $175 an hour. But our overhead was like $18,000 a month. So it was very different. Um, in the beginning, you're not going to be able to charge a ton of money, but it is irresponsible for you to not charge enough value for your time. So I wouldn't charge anything less than $30 an hour hour because that isn't even the living wage. You can't live off of $30 an hour. Uh, anyone who makes less than $30 an hour knows that. Anyone who makes around $30 an hour knows how much of a struggle it is to make that much money. Is a particular sewing machine required for furniture fabric? If yes, how often is it required? So one, you can do upholstery without knowing how to sew or ever having to sew ever. Um, there might be areas where you have to hand stitch stuff, but you don't have to use a sewing machine for stuff. Industrial sewing machines are the best kind of machine to use for upholstery fabric because in a domestic machine, they're not, a, like especially a modern domestic machine, they're made of mostly plastic and they're not built to withstand like thicker, heavier duty fabrics. So an industrial machine is always best, but you don't need an industrial machine to get started. Any old antique sewing machine that is made of all metal can handle upholstery fabric. I got my first, it was a Singer, one of those end table treadle machines uh, for $9 and I used it for two years until I got my first industrial. But investing in industrial is going to make the job easier, it's going to make it go faster, it's going to make it look nicer. Uh, I bought mine for $800 and I've only had to have it tuned up a couple of times in 10 years. So. What is the group? Oh, the group is called the Local Upholstery Club. It's on Facebook, but it's also on the link in my bio. So you can join the group from the link in my bio too, or you can search Local Upholstery Club on Facebook. Fantastic. Oh, so we, that was a lot of questions, guys. Thank you so much. When you're here and you're learning, uh, instead of sending me gifts, I just encourage you to tap the screen and like what it is that you're seeing as much as possible. When I remind you, just sort of tap it violently till that little heart shows up. And then the heart will race to the end of it. When it hits the end, it throws you a party. When you guys do that, it sends my content out through the For You page. People find my business. People come take my classes. And that is how I run my business. You guys are always very effective at doing this. I see we're up to 7,000 likes right now and I see a lot of hearts coming in. Um, it's very effective. I make sales while you guys are here of my classes and you're doing a lot to sustain the upholstery industry just by tapping the screen so I really appreciate when you do that. Uh, so Ray's Revitalized Furniture has put her listing of how much she's seen sewing machines for on the bottom too. Yeah, check out Facebook Marketplace. A lot of times you can see these antique machines are free, so it's really cool. So we're going to finish stapling this down on the top. I'm going to put this back here. i got to grab my coffee real quick. So 
So we've stapled in the middle in the front, in the middle in the back, in the middle on the side, and we've stapled this corner up here. We're gonna staple this middle on this side and then this corner up here. And this is before putting 100 staples in here. This is not the time to start drilling staples in. Things could still go wrong at this point and you don't wanna find yourself removing a ton of staples. So first we evenly distribute the fabric and then we'll go back through and fill in the gaps. So the next staple I'm doing is in the middle on the side here. Let's see where to put this. Maybe this way. So this will get folded under next to that leg, this folded under next to this leg, and then I'm just gonna pull this a little taut. I don't wanna pull it too tight because if someone sits on this, I don't want it to rip away from the staples, but I need to pull it taut so that it's not loose and it doesn't continue to get looser. Because if it gets loose, it's gonna fall in the cracks of these springs, and if it falls in the cracks of these springs, those springs are still at risk of cutting through your foam. So we don't want that. So now up here, I'm gonna fold this around this leg, pop a staple down here, and do the same thing in the upper corner. And now I can do the corners on this side, on both this side of the chair and the other side. already got the middle staple there so I'm folding around the legs pulling out that corner when I pull these corners I'm not just pulling out straight but I'm kind of pulling out this way to stretch the material this way if it starts to buckle in front of your legs you're going to want to make longer cuts so I'm folding it up alongside that leg I'm getting rid of the slack between the staple here and this edge of the leg I don't want the fabric to be wrinkled in this area because it won't look clean and one more thing. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fold all of this over back up in this way because I just want to double over this edge before locking everything in because this fabric can sometimes fray. It actually has a backing material in it that prevents it from fraying, but it has a fray to it. So this will help it to last a little bit longer. So now is when I can put a bunch of staples in because everything is stretched out in its place and it's not going to move. And you'll notice that I didn't put a row of staples under that row of staples because it's completely unnecessary. And if you've ever removed staples before, you will be very grateful that I just did that because if you're the one removing this, you don't have two rows, two rows of staples to remove. So I'm going to do the same thing on this side. And then the same thing for the front. I see the question, is that a special upholstery staple jib? And I think that you may be done. Uh, it is a, a pneumatic staple gun made specifically for upholstery. It's a 22 gauge staple gun with a, what is the crown? I feel like it's a, half inch crown on the top. Um, this is what 22 gauge staples looks like. And these go in this way. Now these staples are much thinner than like a stapler you would get at Home Depot that connects to um, an air compressor. This is a pneumatic stapler, has a hose connected to it, air is what powers it. You can use electric or you can use a manual one too. It doesn't have to be special, but the special ones make the job easier. The staples are thinner, so they do less damage to the material. They're faster too. They don't take any impact on your body, so they're much easier to use, whereas a manual staple, you're like pushing a lot and it can hurt your hands over time. So now, my staples are all within like an inch of each other at this stage. You do not, some layers are going to need and require your staples to be end to end. This is not that layer. But you do not need end to end staples at this point. Just like someone asked before is if there's a limit to how many holes you can put in your piece. Yes. So we're trying to limit how many holes we put in here by only layering up the staples on this layer. So I'm going to go around to the side here and do the same. It'll walk around though.
And then we're going to do the, the same thing in the back. So I'm pushing this back up so we can just double it over. It's very important that the fold doesn't become proud of the frame, which means stick outside of the frame, because you'll see that with your fabric coverage and it'll look like a lump under the material. So everything needs to be on the inside of the frame. And then I have one more area to do that in the back. And now we can go through and cut off the excess material. You want to always cut off excess material because you don't want it to bulk up underneath other materials and create lumps or make it difficult for things to fit flush when they're supposed to. What kind of fabric is that? It's synthetic burlap. And you can use regular burlap, you can use scrap fabric, you can use all kinds of stuff. You just came across my For You page. Can this help with me redoing my VW bus seats? I want to learn. See guys, when you like it, it sends me to a For You page and people find me. Yes, soft furnishing upholstery skills are transferable to auto upholstery skills. It's a little bit different because they attach to the frames differently because the frames are typically made of metal and not wood, but essentially the same concepts, the same way of sewing. I do these live on Tuesdays, so you can learn from whatever project I'm working on, but I also offer in-person upholstery workshops, virtual upholstery workshops, both group and private workshops, and I have tutorials online, anything that it is I can do to try and get you guys to learn. I have a private Facebook group called the Local Upholstery Club. The link to that's in my bio. Go there, join the group, and if you are working on a project and you have questions, you can post it, tag me in it, make sure that I can see it. But there are upholsterers from all walks of life, from all methods of upholstery, from various levels of experience, so you'll get a lot of support in that group just for joining. She does not do car upholstery, but it is all the same fundamentals. Yeah, it's all transferable, but it is different. I don't do car upholstery myself, so you won't see me doing car upholstery, but it is all transferable. Well, what kind of fabric is that? It's, uh, so we went over that. This is synthetic burlap fabric. My grandmother worked at an upholstery shop that made airplane seats. This is fascinating. I'm so glad you have good memories of that because I've been raising my kids around this and they don't think it's cool. So I'm hoping one day that they're like, well, my mom used to do upholstery and I used to build forts out of the furniture. I remember them as good times, but they're jerks, so who knows. Okay, so I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna cut off the excess fabric. I wanna leave about a half inch on the other side of the staple so that it doesn't fray back and come loose. But you do wanna clean up these layers at every stage. Don't wait until you get another layer to cut through two layers at one time. Cut through every layer as you go so that you don't bulk up material and it looks clean along the way and it's much easier to finish. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna go around the whole chair and remove this excess material. And then we can start putting foam up. One more side. So that looks good. That looks nice and clean. Let me give you guys a close up shot of the top. Ooh. Everything is nice and taut. There's no wrinkles or buckling in front of any of the legs. Everything looks good. I can't pinch the fabric and it's not gonna get loose, but it's not so tight that I can't sit on it, which means it doesn't make any weird ripping sounds when I put pressure on it. And that's important. You don't want any weird ripping sounds. So now we have to measure for the foam. We're gonna do the seat foam first. And I think, I'm trying to think, so, I think there was two inch foam on this before. It might've been three inch foam. I don't remember. I don't ever 
but oh hold on there's some right here okay you don't have to make chairs look exactly how they looked when you took them apart. You can redo them any way you want. I can put buttons in this thing, I can put channels in this thing, or I can make it look smooth. I will be doing uh, the way that it was before. Will a lot of these skills transfer to auto upholstery? Indeed they will, indeed they will. The sewing, the pattern making, all of that stuff. I think the difference between auto upholstery and soft furnishings upholstery is some in the technique of how the seats are made with the different decorative details and how the foam is shaped, but also how to attach it to the frame because most auto upholstery frames are metal. Um, even in marine, it's like fiberglass or plastic bases and less wood, so it's a little bit different, but all of the skills are transferable. My grandma used to make purses and duffel bags from the leftover fabric and it was so cool. I'm so glad you have good memories of that. Okay, this is the seat foam from before. You can measure this and make it the same. Uh, this is two inch foam, this is what I suspected. But also if you're unsure if your foam was in dust when you went to go take it off of there, you might not know what the thickness was before. So it's important to learn, like standard seat height is about 18 inches. Now on modern furniture, that's true. On antique furniture, that's less true because people were much smaller so furniture was lower to the ground. So keep Keep that in mind. If your foam is too thick on top of your seat, it's going to feel like you're sitting on a bubble. If it is too thin, you're going to feel all the infrastructure underneath. So it's important to know what kind of foam to use. I'm going to use a medium, it's a high density foam, but a medium firmness on the seat of this. It's going to be a two inch foam. That's going to make sure it's not too soft that when I sit on it, you can feel the springs and not too firm that it's uncomfortable to sit on. A medium is like my most default uh, like firmness that I use on seat foam and I might use soft on the on the arms and on the back because that doesn't get as much weight pressure on it it doesn't have to be as comfortable um, and it can give it a softer look on the back too so I'm going to be using two inch foam for this and now I have to measure the seat to cut off a piece of the foam to use to go on this What's the springy mesh under the seat called? This is called synthetic burlap, but we also have under the seat seat here, this jute webbing, and that is also synthetic. That came with the chair. We're reusing, um, that was in good shape and the springs were in good shape, so we left it as is, but this is called synthetic burlap. In this area, and especially here, it's the same fabric, just a different color and a different weave on the back seat. This is also synthetic burlap, just a different kind. Um, these are used as a barrier for to be between the foam and the springs so that the springs don't cut through the foam over time. In the back that's less true because we don't have springs up there, but in the back that's used as a barrier to help keep that shape so we can put the foam on it and when someone puts their <coughs> excuse me, hand on the back of the chair it doesn't go through the frame. It, it's going to create a barrier there. The foam in Michael's and Joann's is very soft. Where can we get firm foam? Uh, yeah, so you only get one density foam in Joann Fabrics and at Michael's. It's a high density foam, but it's not um, professional upholstery foam. It's more of like a craft foam. I sell foam and D or like upholstery supplies, professional upholstery supplies on my website. You don't have to have a business and they come from the vendor that I order my professional supplies from. They third party ship for me. So you can order them there and everything over $100 is um, free shipping and the foam comes in like big sheets. So you also have to have a room to store the foam unfortunately, but you uh, can save a lot of money. <clears throat> By, by getting it in bulk that way. It's cheaper than getting a smaller piece at uh, Joann's and it is professional upholstery foam. Okay, to measure for foam for this seat, to measure for this foam for the seat, I need to know the distance between the longest point from the back to the front, which for me is in the middle here because it's rounded so it gets narrower at the sides. So I'm gonna measure the longest length from back to front and then I'm going to measure the longest width at the front here because this is the widest part of my chair. In the back it's narrower, so this is gonna be the widest width. So I'm just gonna cut a rectangle out of my foam and then bring it back here and cut it to fit my chair. So 
I need to cut my foam to be a little bit bigger than my frame so that I can carve it to fit the curve of it. So when I measure this, I'm gonna add two additional inches so that it sticks out an inch on either side of the frame. So I have enough material to go through with my electric bread knife and cut that and carve it to fit with the frame. Hi, Gabriel. I see Gabriel here. So that's what we're gonna do. So measure back to front, add two inches. Measure side to side, add two inches. <coughs> So back to front is 20 inches, plus two inches is 22 inches. Side to side is 25 inches, plus two inches is 27 inches. So 22 by 27 inches. Someone remember that, because I will forget by the time we get over here. On this back wall, you can see my wall of upholstery supplies. If you're coming to take in-person upholstery workshops with me, I have all the materials that you'll need on hand available for purchase, so you don't need to worry about picking those up in advance. I don't carry fabric, but I usually have foam and batting and things of that nature here. So I'm going to choose a piece of two inch medium density foam. All my two inch foam is medium. It's high density, medium uh, uh, firmness foam. And then I'm going to put it on the table and then we're going to measure it out so that we can cut the piece for the chair, which is 22 by 27 inches. You guys have got to remember that for me. to be an avalanche of foam so I have to take care of some stuff first. This is the chair we've been working on so we'll get back to it. We have some cotton batting. We don't need that yet but we might need it later. You do not need fancy saws to cut foam. You can use a serrated bread knife. Any serrated knife will work. One thing that I have that is really cool to use is an electric bread knife or an electric meat carver. Those make amazing foam cutters and they last a really long time. So I suggest you pick one up. You can find them at thrift stores for super cheap because everyone buys them and nobody uses them so they always give them away. So I need to measure a piece that's 22 inches by 27 inches wide. This is 30 inches wide. Let me double check that. Yep, 30 inches wide. So I'm gonna take my 27 inches this way and my 22 inches this way to conserve material. So I take less material off of the long uh, length of this film that I can use later on down the road. So I'm gonna do 29 inches down this way using my square edge against the factory edge of this foam is gonna help me make a nice square measurement. I'm also on the very edge of the square edge of the foam this way, so one, I can compare and see if it's square, 
In this case, it's not important if it's 100% square so long as I have the coverage in the center because I'm going to be cutting off all the excess. But when you're making square cushions, you're going to want to make sure that this measurement is square. So a T-square is going to help you make that perfect measurement. So I'm measuring it 27 inches this way. Then I'm going to go up maybe about 24 inches or so, estimate. Uh, and then I'm going to mark 27 inches this way. So now I can come through here at the square edge of the top and connect these two dots with my T-square and mark my 22 inches down this line after connecting those dots here and then on this side I'll bring it all the way down to this side because it's a nice square edge and mark 22 inches on this side. So. If my factory edge is square, when I line my square up with the square edge on this end of the foam and connect it with that dot, it should land right on and connect with that dot down here, which makes this a perfect 90 degree square. So if my foam needed to be 90 degrees squared, I got it. That's it's going to be 90 degrees square. And to do that, I use an electric bread knife, but my plug is not close enough. So I'm going to find a different way to find this one. Unfortunately, these knives are not made to cut foam, so the trigger's on the wrong side and the cord's not well enough for what you want to do. So if you're going to use one of these as a foam cutter, you're going to have to be prepared to have extension cords and uh, practice your grip on this. So when we're cutting into our foam, in this case I can go straight down to the table. The end of this knife is not sharp at all, it's rounded. So I can touch the table. It's going to be loud, but it's not going to cut the table, it's not going to hurt the table. And I can drag it right down the line that I marked. The other thing that you want to keep in mind is when you're cutting, you want to keep your blade perfectly straight. If you bend it in any way, it's going to cut your foam at a bevel and it's not going to fit properly. So you want to make sure that you're holding your blade straight up. So I do this by pulling the blade towards me and of course away from my body because I don't want to cut myself. So I'm going to start this and it's going to be loud, you won't hear me talking through this, up here and then I'm going to keep the blade perfectly straight up and down and I'm going to pull this towards me until I cut it loose from the foam. It's not sharp all the way through. It actually doesn't cut all the way through, but it leaves just a tiny film that is easily terrible that I can just pull right off. So now I just got to cut it in this direction. Try to avoid cutting like this. You can't see the angle of your blade. You're going to get it crooked every single time. Try to make sure that you're cutting it straight. You might be able to dangle it off the edge of the table and cut it this way straight, we'll do that. We'll get less of the sound that way. But do make sure you're watching your blade. When it starts to fall in this corner is when you're gonna start to skew your cut. 
So you want to make sure that you're there to brace that end before it falls off so you don't get a crooked cut. Now you can see how smooth, how smooth the cut looks. Here is the edge where we tore everything, so it's not smooth at that very bottom edge. But these cuts are nice and clean. And you can see any movement. You see it's not like perfectly straight. It's a little wavy. So you've got to be real careful and go real slow to make, slow to make sure you're doing it properly. Okay, I can't read comments without glasses. see. Okay. If you choose high seat foam, how do you stop from getting bagging on fabric in the front of the chair? If you're experiencing your fabric getting baggy on top of your foam in front of your chair, it's because your fabric wasn't pulled on tight enough to, it wasn't pulled on taut enough. So there, it was put on too loose and when people start to sit in it, it overstretches already, it gets baggy much faster. So that would be, you would just have to put it on tighter. And we'll do that with the seat when we get fabric in. Today we're just going to be putting foam and batting on. Did you say you put foam between the spring and the first layer of fabric material, or do you use webbing? I do not, so I'm going to show you. That's a confusing question because there's a lot going on there. So I'm putting foam on top of my springs. Uh, but I put a layer of barrier fabric there first. This is synthetic burlap, but you can use regular burlap, you can use duck cloth, you can use heavy duty scrap fabric, anything. I do jute webbing, then springs, then my barrier fabric, then foam, then batting, and I always put a layer of cotton batting on the top too. Rachel uses webbing, then spring, then tie spring, then burlap, then foam, then batting. Yes, same same order. You said you kept the springs because they were still good. How can you tell? Well, very rarely will the springs go bad. Um, unless they're like rusted and broken, you can't use them anymore. Very rarely is that the case. This is a more modern chair too. Everything on it is still relatively new. It was built in 2000, so it hasn't been used very much. All the jute webbing is still tight, not sagging. Everything is still tight up here. The shape has maintained the shape, so it still has like 30, 40 years before anything happens. Springs hold up a really long time. It's the strings that sometimes can get tattered and fall apart, and the jute webbing, if it's a natural jute webbing, tends to disintegrate and tear away. This is a synthetic, so it's probably going to last a little bit longer longer in that respect. Uh, this is not a cheaply made chair. It was made very well. It's still made with hardwoods. So <clears throat> even though it's more modern, it's still a well-made chair. I use my bread knife to do mine last time. Yeah, bread knives are great for cutting foam. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to glue this to the surface of the seed. So we're going to use a contact adhesive. We're going to spray one side of the foam and then we're going to spray the the side of the seat and we're going to stick this on it. This is not going to be able to get tucked through the sides right away. We have to make some cuts before we do that, but we do want to get it glued down on the frame so that it doesn't move before we make our cuts. This is going to be bigger than the seat. We're going to cut it, uh, carve it to the frame to fit it after we get it glued on. So that's what we're going to work on now. Let me get this set up so you guys can see really well. So everything I'm putting on this chair here today, you can purchase from my website. So if it's something you need for yourself or your own projects, you can go to my website and find it there. This is contact adhesive. You can get contact adhesive at the hardware store, you can get it at Joanne Fabrics, you can get it at Michael's. This contact adhesive is specifically made to fuse foam together. It's an upholstery foam contact adhesive. It's a super duper adhesive. The adhesives that you use at Home Depot or Joanne Fabrics are not this strong. They will not fuse foam together. We're, however, just going to use this to stick the foam to the seat. And a contact adhesive from Home Depot or Joann's is perfect for that use because you just need it to get a little bit tacky to hold the foam still so that it doesn't move when you cut it or when you're reupholstering it. 
So what a contact adhesive is, is that it only sticks to itself. So I have to spray this to the surface of my barrier fabric and I also have to spray it to the surface of my foam before I stick it together. And I wanna make sure that it's not wet when it touches. So I'm gonna spray this down on both surfaces and I'm gonna let it dry for a couple of seconds, like 15, 20 seconds until it gets tacky. And then I'm gonna place my phone on top of the seat deck and it's going to be a pretty permanent stick. Now, if you're fast enough, you can pull it up if you need to like move it or place it around, but pretty much it's a very permanent stick like right off the get, so be very careful. Those sawhorses too are genius. Yeah, and you know what? They're $25 at Home Depot. <laughs> I built the boxes to put on them. My husband worked with me to put all of these together, but the sawhorses, the black things themselves, are 25 bucks, and they fold up. I have a bunch of them here for my classes so that you can stow them away very easily. They're very portable. I have a pair at home that also have adjustable height, which are really cool too. Those are not $25. Those are like $100 a piece. So. I'm going to spray this. This contact adhesive comes out and it looks like Spider-Man's webs, like when he shoots webs. So it's pretty controllable. There's not a lot of overspray. You can see where it goes. <clears throat> I'm not trying to super saturate the layer. I don't need it to be really wet and goopy and gluey. I just need a thin film over top to grip to this foam. So I did a thin coat over top there. I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm not gonna go edge to edge because I don't need it edge to edge. This is way bigger than I need it. But I am gonna just do sort of like the center where it's gonna make contact with the seat. And that's that. So hard to see once you get it on there. And I do give it like a little shake to sort of dry it. And sometimes I'll even use it to fan the seat before I put it on. Now one of the things that I will do is I can, when I go to put this on, I can prioritize this edge with the front edge of the seat so that I don't have to worry about cutting that too much. So that's what I'm gonna do is I'm going to prioritize this edge first. Now keep in mind when I stick these together, it's going to be a permanent adhesion. So I wanna make sure that it's centered before I put it down. So I'm gonna line it up in the front here first and then I'm gonna push it down through the middle, and then I'm gonna push it out to the sides. Now it's gonna fold up around here, and these parts that are glued are gonna to touch this area. But there's no glue on this area, so it's not gonna stick. But sometimes it could leave a sticky residue. So this is why I'm doing the seat first before I have any of the sides so that the sticky residue doesn't stick to the batting or fabric or anything I got going on here. So this is the game of chance. While you guys are here, if you're learning something, you're enjoying what it is that we're doing here, all I ask is that you tap on the screen while you're here to get those likes to go up as much as possible. When you're doing that, it's sending this information out on the For You page. People find me, they take my classes. I offer in-person workshops and virtual upholstery workshops, live and private lessons. So if you ever want to take a class with me, you can. On Tuesdays, you can come here and learn what it is that I'm working on for free. But all I ask is that you tap the screen. I wouldn't even ask you to send gifts because I get fractions of a penny on the dollar that you spend on TikTok to send gifts, it is way more valuable to me for you to tap the screen. When you tap it violently over and over and over, like I can see someone doing in the corner, a little heart shows up in this upper corner and it's like on a meter. If it reaches the end, it throws your party, everybody's happy and that's, that's the goal. So whenever I remind you, if you're learning something, please tap the screen because it goes a long way to help me grow my business. Okay, so this is it. We're going to line it up at the front first. I do want this edge up at the front. I'm going to bring it just like uh, an eighth of an inch outside the edge so that it's not too far back or sharp up against this. And then I'm gonna first push down in the center and it's already stuck, like I can't lift it. And then I'm gonna push down to the sides and you'll see this foam is going up and around the sides, that's fine, that's perfect. I don't need it to go through the holes yet. I just need it to stick down to the seat. So I'm trying to get it as firm as possible, and I got a little bit of a twist here. So replace that. So I'm sort of pre-teching these edge areas so that this can stay. And now the next step is to make the cuts in the foam so that it goes around the barriers of the chair frame just like we did with the barrier fabric. So it works the same with the foam. 
except for it's a lot harder to cut. So I'm going to show you how to make those cuts. Let's get close. Okay. So on this chair, we have a barrier that is the arm here, and we have legs in the back. So I need to make a cut that goes straight for the middle of that arm and sort of V's out so that it can go around that arm and through the seat. Let me get closer and point it further down. Now you can use scissors to cut foam. It's harder the thicker the foam. You can also use a serrated knife. Because I have glue on this, I'm going to use a crappy pair of scissors. And I'm going to do the same thing I did with the fabric, which is cut straight for this leg, which is about this thick. And then when I get closer to the edge, I'm going to veer off and cut towards the outside of the edge. So there'll be a little V or a Y in front of this leg. It's going to be harder to see on the foam, guys, but you'll be able to go back and watch the video later. So straight for the center. And then before I get too close, I'm going to make a cut that goes this way for this side of the leg and a cut that goes this way for this side of the leg. So this cut first. And then the second cut. So when you see that, you can see that it's cut into a V. Now this little V can tuck by the arm, and this one can come up around that side. So that that will now lay flat. Once I get the back cut here, this will go in through that arm, right through that pull through spot. So that's what I want to do. My next cut is straight for this back leg, which is this wide. It's going to go straight for the middle and then Y off towards the sides. Now, if you make your cut a little too long at this stage, it's not a huge deal. Mine is cut a little far back here. You won't be able to see it once it gets tucked through. If it's a big gap, you can stuff it full of cotton batting. If it is a tiny gap, you can cover it with batting and no one's ever going to see it. So don't freak out at this stage if you're not super good at it doesn't have to be exact. So it's going to get harder for you to see this V cut, but that's the V cut here. This is going to go down here. Now this can get tucked all the way back. This is a lot of foam. And I don't want to wrestle with cutting all of this or with tucking all of this in that tiny little hole. So I'm going to trim it back first because I just need it long enough to tuck inside here. It doesn't even have to go all the way out to the edge. It just needs to tuck underneath that arm. So I'm just going to trim a lot of this off. It's still folded up along this arm, so that's how I know I have like too much. So when I go to tuck it back there, it'll fit under. So you just need enough to tuck under there. So that's gone, and now I can come through here and tuck it through the side. Now, if I didn't cut enough and there's still some foam sticking out of the side here, I can use my electric bread knife and come through and trim off the excess. But lucky for me, I cut off just enough. It's like I've been doing this a minute. So this part can go back after we get the other side cut. So let's cut this side here same cut straight for the middle and then out towards the arms so the cut looks down like this and then goes this way towards the edge of the arms and it's hard to see how far that cut goes so you really got to be paying attention and watching i can see a little bit better over top of So that one's good. Now I gotta make this cut down to this leg. And harder to do. Again, you can use the electric bread knife or a serrated knife, might be easier to cut through at this stage. Two inch thick foam is very thick foam. This is my leg. I'm cutting for the center of this leg. A 
and then when I get close, I want my cut to go around that leg. So I cut it in a Y shape, one to this side of the leg and one to that side of the leg. there and of course this is all a lot of extra material that I don't need I just need this material to tuck back so I'm gonna leave a little lip so that it tucks back but cut off the rest of the excess And then everything else gets tucked around these legs and still looks nice and clean. Now we have the same thing going on in the back here where we have a lot of extra material. We don't want to wrestle with shoving all of this back. It's unnecessary, so I'm going to cut off these extra flats. Here and on this side. that were in front of the legs just sort of push down in front of that leg to make it look nice and smooth. Look at that. So that's how nice and clean it looks. And you can even see back here, there's a little gap, like I cut a little too far, but you're not going to be able to see that. You can put glue in there, a little bit of spray adhesive, and it will stick back to itself if it's too big. Would one of those hot wire cutters work? It sure would, but how our cutters burn this plastic, which is made of like caustic materials and zero gases. I, if you're going to use a hot wire cutter, make sure that you're using it in a ventilated, a well ventilated space and that uh, you're wearing a respirator. Let's see, I'm looking for other questions. Uh, I don't want those boxes too. I'm going to have to copy. Please do copy. These are really great. Uh, these are really great assets for my shop and for my students too. So we have just a little bit of overhang up here. This isn't glued down. There was no glue contact there. So I'm going to glue that down because I'm coming back through here with my electric bread knife and then trimming this to fit perfectly. But I don't want my foam to move. So again, I'm going to spray both sides. I'm going to let that get tacky. I'm going to do that to the whole front, actually. And then once that's glued down, I'm going to come back through with the electric bread knife to trim it around. So let's get that going. So, I'm pull this, pull on it just a little bit so it comes out a little bit proud of the front. And stick it down all the way. Now that's permanent. Now this foam lifts up the whole chair. That's how very, very permanent that spray is. Okay, so now that we've got cut down, I'm going to take my electric bread knife across the frame of this and trim the foam directly to the frame. The cool thing is, is I can use the frame as a guide for my knife and run that all the way across and it'll make it a nice straight cut. The difficult part is getting the knife to go straight and trusting yourself to do it right. So I like to start with uh, the foam as far up this blade as possible because then I have more control over it. And then I'll make sure that my knife is pressed up against this frame the whole time. So now that I've started, my knife is pressed up against the frame. I could hold my knife, literally hold it, 
to the front. So long as I'm not touching the blade part where it pinches, if I hold the back part, I can hold it to that frame and it'll go straight the whole way. That's okay, it's going to be covered by the batting. I'm going to come back through and clean up that spot. It looks like too thin there. it doesn't have to be perfectly flush because I'm going to be covering this with a layer of batting so any like little uh, tolerances or little shakiness you're not going to be able to see but you don't want to carve into the shape I have a nice clean edge here on the top it's not carved back it's not beveled it will go straight forward that's the goal with batting we can soften it up and make it look nice so I'm going to do the same thing here it's so difficult to hold this thing Running it up the side of the chair. That looks good. It only comes off a little back here, but you can run the blade this way too. side. Now here we don't want anything sticking outside of the frame because we have a panel of fabric that goes here and if anything sticks outside of this frame you're going to see it lumped up behind that fabric. We're going to do the same to the back and the sides if we need to. That side looks good. That's already trimmed back enough. That's what we like to see. And the back has just a little bit sticking out, so we'll go over the back. I'm going to pull it through all the way to make sure it's tucked through. And then take my bread knife through to the frame and trim it back flush with the frame this way. look at what we've done, shall we? Oh, that happened. Okay, so now the seat is complete. And the next step is to get the foam on the back and sides. So, we're going to measure for this piece first. The foam that I'm using on the back of the seat, I'm going to go check on something too real quick. 
I think it's going to start posting questions. And definitely like, 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 like while you're in here. When you guys are liking this, well, liking everything that you see, it's shooting my stuff out to the For You page, and then people find what it is that I do for a living, which is teach a poultry workshop. So you get to learn for free here on Tuesdays. All you got to do is like it when I remind you. And then uh, I have virtual poultry workshops, live ones you can take with me, both group and private. And I do in-person workshops, weekend poultry camps, uh, looking to tour on the United States this year. Hi Kathleen, hello. Is there a rule in here to start a fabric stapling? I have rules for fabric stapling and that is to first evenly distribute your fabric before you put any staples in it. Uh, lots and lots of rules. So thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for hitting the like button while you're here. So we've got quite a few of you in here now. Now we're going to do some measurements for the foam for the back of the chair. So I am going to use I am torn. I think I'm going to use one inch foam. Let me see what they used on theirs. Hold on. Yeah, one inch foam. So this is the original material of the chair, and I'm going to replace it because the your out, outward upholstery is only ever as good as the infrastructure underneath. So if the infrastructure underneath and the material underneath is 20, 30 years old, then everything that goes on top of it is going to die at the same time this dies. And this was last upholstered in 2000, which was 24 years ago. The springs are still in great shape. They're going to last another 30, 40 years, but the foam is not in great shape. So we're going to replace all of that so everything looks brand new. This chair is what I'm working on for the New Year New Chair Challenge that I'm doing with uh, uh, Lindsay Madsen of Madam of Making over on Instagram. Me and a handful of upholsterers are going to be doing um, some really cool chairs. This is one that I'm getting started so that we can get the furniture or fabric on before my date, which is January 22nd is when you're going to see the reveal of this chair. So you get to help me on Tuesdays. So I'm going to measure one inch foam for the back and sides of this chair. This is going to need three panels of foam one for the back piece and one for each arm of the chair. These panels are just gonna cover the face of the chair. They're not going to wrap around to the sides. They're just gonna go on the face. This will, however, come around and round out the top and it's gonna round out the top on the arms but it's gonna stop flush to the sides. So we're gonna measure for those panels now. And when you're measuring for this, when you're measuring for patterns, for foam, and for materials on this, and this particular chair is a wrap and staple chair, you're thinking in terms of rectangles and squares. Don't think about the roundness or the shapes or the polygons that you're looking at. Think in rectangles or squares because you start with that and you cut it to fit its shape and then you don't have to worry about that shape. It's going to be tailored to fit it. So I need to measure the longest point from the top of the chair to the bottom here, which it actually needs to tuck inside that hole just like the two inch did because the foam has to come together like this in the seat so that it is uh, touching like this. So you don't want the foam to butt up into it like this. You want it to come together like this. So that foam also has to tuck down inside there. So I'm gonna measure the longest length from the center from the top to bottom inside the frame and through and then the widest width from the top across because that's wider up here it's narrower on the bottom so this is going to be a polygon shape after it's cut and then these sides are going to be rectangles so that's the lengths I'm measuring so from the top and it has to go over roll over this edge all the way down through the frame outside to the bottom is 23 inches. I'm going to add an inch so that I have some extra material so that I can trim it to fit it. So I'm going to do 24 inches tall and then the widest width and this is not gonna actually it is. I'm going to have it wrap around uh, the sides to round off these sides because these sides aren't perfect. It's going to start on this side and come around to the other. Now keep in mind this is a curve, it's concave, so you want your measuring tool to go into it, not to be across it, because this is a shorter distance. So, from this side, fold it over, run all the way across the top, and hold on that side, is 24 inches. I'm going to give it an extra inch um, to make sure that I have enough and make it 25 inches so I can carve it to fit. And because of those two inches or those two distances, the 24 inch and 25 inch are so close, I'm going to do a 25 inch square so I don't have to remember too many measurements 
on my way to the cutting table, which is where we're going now. If you guys have questions, go ahead and put them in the comments. Oh, let's measure those arms first. So we have a 25 inch square for the seat back and we'll measure the arms too. Now at some point this foam overlaps this foam on the side here. So we have to keep that in mind when we measure it. So I'm going to measure it a little bit further in here. And then this is not going to wrap around the face of the arm. It's going to stop there. So I'm holding the ruler to this at the top, which I believe is the widest point. And I've got 15 inches. I'm going to add an inch to make sure I can carve it to fit it. So at 16, this has to come through the frame on the bottom, come around and wrap around the top. That's giving me 10 inches. I'm going to add an inch and then I'm going to make it 11. So we have enough. So we have 15 by 11 inches and a 25 inch square. I'm going to write it on the board so that I don't forget. This is a cool part of having a classroom nearby. So 25 inch by 25 and then 15 by 11 inch square. Now, when you're cutting this out of foam, the direction doesn't matter because there's no nap to it. When you're cutting it on fabric, you're going to want to know which way is 15 and which way is 11 inches. But here, we don't need to do that. My grandma used to write it on her hand. I've done that, too. But I can see this from across the room while I'm talking to you guys, so I write it on the board. Okay, so I'm going to get some one-inch foam down. A little bit easier to access up here. weird because I'm in a maker space and we don't have a kitchen to make bacon. If you guys are here and you're learning something, all I ask is that you tap the screen while you're here. When you're tapping the screen, it sends my content out to the For You page and people find me and that's how I run my business. They use that for spring floor and gymnastics. Not this particular foam, they don't. This is a different type of foam, but the place that I get this foam, they do sell that type of high density foam for gymnastics. This is a poultry foam. This is a medium density one inch foam. Sometimes I like to use a soft density on the backs, but this is pretty heavy duty. This is what I'd like to use for this chair. <laughs> need, my arms are 15 by 11 inches, and this is 30 inches wide. So this is 30 inches wide. I can get two of my arms out of the width of this. So I'm gonna make that measurement first. So I will go, I have two arms that are 15 inches wide. So from the square edge of this, I'm going to use my T-square. I'm going to mark um, 15 inches, and then the end is 30 inches already. So I'm just going to make a mark at 15 inches here. I'm going to move it a little bit further down and make another mark at 15 inches, squaring up this edge on the foam. And then I can make connect these dots make that line and this depth has to be 11 inches so I'm going to make a mark there for 11 inches and then I'm going to come down to this edge and make a mark at 11 inches and then I'm going to make one all the way up here at the top too and then I can connect to these dots and if my foam is square I can square up this edge and when I line up one dot it's going to line up the rest of the dots which it does beautifully so cut those out so these are my arms. With one inch foam, you can use scissors to cut it. So that's gonna be much easier. The next one that I need to do is the back, which is a 25 inch square. This is 30 inches wide. So I'm going to mark 25 inches down this line. I'm gonna move this up a little bit and I'm gonna mark 25 inches up here. Then I can connect these dots. That's a different, so important to note that on one side of this ruler it starts at 48 inches and one side it starts at one and you always want to make sure you're starting at the wrong side so one 25 inches up here that is at 25 inches so now they should match up and 
And then I need the length of this to be 25 inches, so I can square up this edge up here, with this edge down here, mark it at 25 and continue that line. And on this end down here, I can make a mark at 25, and now I can connect these two dots. So that's a 25 inch square, and everything is looking square. I do see that my phone is now dying. Hold on, let's get that figured out. should work okay we got juice do you decide the foam uh, uh, density yes it says fitness but I assume you mean density yes uh, you get to decide the foam density I have defaults that I use I don't like to give my customers a lot of options because there are so many different types of foam there's like uh, low-end quality foam mid-grade quality foam high-end quality foam and in between those grades there's also soft, medium soft, medium, medium firm, firm, firm firm, like there's a lot of different variations in between them. I use a nice mid-grade foam that either has a soft, medium, or firm uh, density. So um, I tend to stay there unless someone has some interest for a specialty uh, foam, but otherwise I try and keep it simple. Um, and if someone has a preference, I can, I can find them any kind of foam that they want. Otherwise, I'll just use that because giving people too much choices can make the process take a lot longer. So I'm using medium density, I'm using high density, medium firmness foam. Can you ever use memory foam? You absolutely can. You can use memory foam. The thing with memory foam is it's called memory foam because it assumes the memory of the, the action that has always happened. If it's a bed and you lay in it, over time, it's going to make a dip where you lay in it. If it's a seat and you sit in it, over time, it's going to be a dip where you sit in it. It's going to, that's how it's designed is to sort of meet the shape of, of what it is. So not ideal for furniture because it can like very quickly start to make everything look kind of gross. But not bad if you're putting like a thin layer of memory foam on top to sort of make that upper layer softer. Okay, so now I can cut this with scissors. And then we're gonna apply it to the chair the same way that we apply the seat. It's much easier to cut one inch foam with scissors than it is to cut two inch foam with scissors. Now this line was a mistake. I don't need that there. I just need to cut this in half for the arms. And sometimes foam will have like this crust on the side that can easily be peeled off. This is just going to take it in so it's not crust. The crust can easily be peeled off and it'll make it softer. Because foam is made just like how bread is made in like a big tin, like bread. So you just dump all the chemicals in there and it blows up to the shape of the tin. And that's cool. Okay. I'm not going to be able to go too far because i got to keep this plugged in. I can move this to face you. Okay. So the next step is to glue everything down. So we're going to start here with the back panel. Oh, I didn't cut off the edge. I still have a piece to cut off. Hold on. Yeah. 
So using the same contact adhesive that we had before, we're going to put contact adhesive on the back of the chair, and we're going to put contact adhesive on the back of the foam, and then we're going to stick them together. There is a, a delicacy to how you do that. Oh no, my foam broke. This is the contact adhesive that I use. So this is specifically to fuse uh, upholstery foam together. So it's a very heavy duty contact adhesive. I had to fix the top on it. It's a very heavy duty contact adhesive. You can get contact adhesive from Home Depot. It's not as strong as this. This is made to fuse two pieces of foam together. I'm not using it for that right now. I'm using it to glue it to this, in which case the Home Depot contact adhesive works fine. The thing about contact adhesive is it only sticks to itself. So you have to spray the foam side and you have to spray the seat chair side in order for them to stick together. This comes out sort of like Spider-Man's webs and it's very controllable. There's not a lot of overspray so you can see what you're doing. So try not to get any overspray. It is difficult to get this out of things. You either need oil or acetone to get it out of things. So be very careful as you put it on. So I just am putting like a light coat of this contact adhesive on the frame, but I do need the adhesive to go around the sides and on top of the back here because that's where the foam is going to roll and I need it to stick really well to those sides. So I am going to put a generous amount of adhesive to the sides and onto the foam. So now I have the adhesive on the frame. Now I can apply it to my phone. And be careful because when these two halves meet each other, it's going to be a permanent stick. So you want to make sure that you're placing it before you drop it down or else you're going to be placing it on crooked. And you, you might not be able to pull it off. So I do need the sides, these two sides to be tacky before I stick them together. So I'm just going to sort of like use them to air each other out. Once they're tacky to the touch, you can test it by touching it, then you can start placing it. Now for this, I need the bottom part of this foam has to tuck into the side. This a little bit more so you can see what I'm doing. So I need the bottom part of this foam still has to tuck back here. It doesn't have to tuck back all the way, but it has to tuck back beyond this frame so that the two pieces of foam sort of meet like this and they look nice and tight up against each other. So I want to make sure that I have more down here than I need so that I can tuck it up to the top enough to, oof, enough to roll around the top edge so it's got to be taller than the top and enough to roll over these sides. This foam will not roll to the back of the chair. I do not want my foam in any way to come to the back of the chair because it'll bulk up that area and make it look really sloppy when I go to put the back panels on. So very carefully, and I'm gonna fold this up to the center too because if this gets glued straight across, I'm gonna miss this concaveness and it won't lie flat in there. And I want it to lie flat in there, so I'm gonna fold it in half and sort of center place it a little long at the bottom and place it in the center and then we'll press it down in the center first so that it sticks there and then I'm going to just sort of like wipe it out to the sides on both sides. Now the glue on this foam won't stick to this part of the chair because there's no glue on that part of the chair. So it's only going to stick to parts that I want it to. And I also have to roll around the side. So the next step is I actually have to make some cuts to relieve the foam so that it'll go around the side. The first one is going to be right here in the ditch of this arm. 
because I need this to wipe around this way, I need to make a cut straight across this frame up to this frame so that that foam will wrap around that side. And I'm just using this as a guide and then wiping this this way. So I should be able to now bend this over the side and it'll cover. There's just not enough glue on the foam there, so I'm going to re-glue the foam in the sides so that that will stick down. And that's going to need to dry, so we'll come back to it. I'm going to do it around all the edges, though. And let that dry a minute. I can make my cut here. I use a pair of really crappy scissors to cut foam that has glue on it. Otherwise, it's going to get real messy and it's going to mess up your fabric scissors. So this material here is extra. I don't need it. I can cut it loose right along the edge of that line where that frame is because this arm is going to meet up that. But I do want to keep that cut as straight as possible for when I put that side arm foam on. Oops, went too far down. Luckily there's glue on it. straight line up that way and I'll need the same line up this way so this piece should be narrow enough now that it will tuck back through the frame and it might be too much material you can trim it back But now I've got that tucked back. That looks great. So now let's take a look at these arms. Let me turn this chair. Move this to the side so you guys can see how this rolls over the edge. Now I want this to roll over and foam up this side, but I don't want it in the back. I need the back to stay flush. So I'm very careful to just sort of press without stretching to make sure I can get it tucked on that side. Now if it doesn't stay stuck all the way to the edges, you can go back in there with some glue and make sure that you're getting your glue all the way to the edge. That's my issue with this side. There's not enough glue on the very edge. So that's got to dry, that's got to get tacky, but I can do the upper part of this chair. I think that's ready. So this can also come down, fold, and glue, and it'll stick right to that edge. This side you guys can see goes right up to the edge. So after I've got it glued down I can come back through with my electric bread knife and trim it to fit the frame. The other side's drying but I think that I've got enough material here that I can trim it for you guys. So I'm going to take this knife and I'm just going to flush it up against the frame and use it as a guide to cut this up. Here I'm going to use the back of the frame to cut this flat. And my knife is just flat up against this. You don't need an electric knife. You can use a regular serrated bread knife. That'll work too. But just use the frame as your guide. And it's going to make that foam cut flush with that frame. This looks so pretty. I got you. The side. So this is all nice and flush with the back of the frame. I'm going to do the same thing at the top.
as long as I'm using the frame as a guide, this line of the foam is going to follow that same line. Look at that. Gorgeous. Beautiful. And the foam is sticking down nice. That's a nice, clean, sculpted edge. So this is the sculpting part of the upholstery phase. This is how you get a nice good shape. So this can come back now. This is dry, ready to cut. And then I can come up from the frame this way. So now both of my sides look great. The other side looks a little bit better. This looks a little like it got in. But that's because my frame I sawed out a little bit extra there on accident. It's not a big deal. It'll still look great. Okay, let's turn this around so we can do the arms. Fun. We're tethered to a cord here, so we're getting tripped up. So the next step is to do the arms the same exact way. We don't want the arms to fold across the front, but they are going to fold across the top. We don't want anything to come to the side of the frame unless it's fabric because we don't want to bulk up those areas. But look how nice and round that looks from the front. Doesn't that look great? This is where we cut a little deep, but it's glued back up there and the other foam is going to hold it in place. So this foam has to go this way. It has to be long enough to tuck into the bottom here. So when we start it, we want to make it long and long enough to wrap around the top. It doesn't need to go on the sides and it's only going to meet this edge of the foam here. So we're going to prioritize it up there. So I'm going to glue this area first and then the foam and then stick it to it. So put glue wherever you need the foam to stick. And then you have to put it on the same places on the foam. And because my foam is going to meet this edge, I'm going to put glue on that edge, which I already did. And then I'm going to actually put glue on this edge so when they touch each other, they fuse together. Which is why it is good to have good uh, upholstery contact adhesive because it will fuse foam together permanently. So I need this to be tacky before I stick it together. I can't wait to see it finish. Oh, you got to see the fabric. And you can go to my Facebook page and see it, but I am carving this whole table out with like this peony floral arrangement on the top, and these chairs are being upholstered to match it. So this chair is being reupholstered for the New Year New Chair Challenge that I'm doing with Madam of Making on Instagram. And if you follow that, there's opportunities, especially if you're a DIY person, there's opportunities to win big tool packages and cool prizes. I'm giving away a Furniture Nerd hoodie. So there's lots of cool things that you can win if you follow that. And if you're following that challenge, you're helping all of the upholsterers that are involved in that to grow their businesses so get involved and you'll I'll be posting about it here on TikTok and on Facebook and on Instagram and Pinterest and all of the places where you post things so you'll be able to follow up there okay so now I'm ready to place this I need it long enough on the bottom so that it'll eventually tuck but I'm not going to start tucking it and it needs to right away be pushed up against this edge so that's my first point of contact and then before I push it down anywhere else, make sure it's too long on the bottom. And then pressing it into the sides. Already I'm glued really well here. That turned out good. And I can push it over this side. And then this foam 
needs to just tuck back through there. But it's got this barrier of the arm, so there needs to be a cut made first. So this arm won't let it go all the way through, so I'm going to do that wide cut for that arm. So that part can go on this side, and this part can get touched through here. That looks excellent. Check that out. This is what it looks like Ooh. up close to the seat. So you need these two pieces of foam to be tucked together like that. You need them to meet like that. So I've tucked that back just a little bit, but not enough to come out to the other side of the frame. And then you can watch me carve it flush with the frame on this side. Let me get my knife. So using the frame as a guide, I can flush my knife up with the frame and cut it off this way. I don't want any of this foam to fold over the edge of this arm because if it has to attach to the outside edge where I attach my outside panel, there's going to be a lump there and it's going to make it look sloppy. So I want to keep my outside edge where my outside fabric panels go nice and smooth so that it doesn't get sloppy. I'm just going to use my frame to cut it to this point. Beautiful. Look at how nice and clean that looks. So we're going to do the same exact thing to the other side now. Let me get these cords stretched a little bit. Actually, oh. uh -oh. I lost you. I'm tethered by a charger, so. my extension cords around. Let's try this again. So now we're going to glue this arm. So first we put a contact adhesive on. The contact adhesive needs to cover this whole surface and then the wood on the top where the foam rolls over. And it also needs to glue this edge of the foam right here. I'm being very careful not to get glue on my seat because if I touch this foam down to my seat that already has glue on it, it's going to permanently stick to here. But I can see and control my other foam. So that's going to dry and get tacky. Where is my other piece of foam? And then this has to be glued to stick to it. Every, the whole surface has to be glued. Okay. This edge of the foam also has to be glued so that it fuses to that edge of the foam. Okay, so I'm gonna use my foam to fan it. And when I apply this, remember, I need it to be a little bit longer on the bottom so that I can tuck it in. And it has to be long enough to roll over the top. And I also have to start it on this side here. You don't want there to be any puddles of glue. If they're still wet, it's not going to stick. And if you stick it too soon, you can stick it to uh, itself and then it doesn't, um, it doesn't ever like reconstitute. You can't use it. So. Okay, so now with this edge, on the bottom, leaving it a little bit longer than we need. I'm going to push this far edge up against where the foam meets here so that that fuses first. That's good. I already started to stick up here before I was ready, so I need to make this a little bit longer. And then start to push it in the middle. Now 
then I can start to roll it over the arm this way so that everything still meets up. Looking good, and now I can make my cuts in my phone so that I can tuck it back. So this piece, this piece can be tucked all the way back. It might be too long. So you might end up needing to trim some off. In that case, in this case, it is too long to wrestle with. So once I get it trimmed, I can tuck it back. It just has to go just between this seat foam and the frame. They just have to meet like this, so that they look nice and smooth and tight there. This looks good. Needs a little bit of glue and edge here. Let that dry a second. And then we're going to trim it to fit it. So this first step I can trim right up the front. I just push the knife flush with the frame. across the front. This is stuck down good now, so now I can use the frame on the side to trim it flush with the side. Let's take a look at what that looks like. From over here, from this angle. So using the frame as my guide, I can push my knife up into the frame and cut it flush with the frame. here. I got a little jagged here because I stopped paying attention, but batting is also going to go over this so you're not going to be able to see any of those slight imperfections. But you don't want anything rolling over to this side of the frame because this has to stay nice and flat and clean for the final fabric that goes on top. What time are we looking at today? Almost one o'clock. And I can unplug this knife too because I think it's all right, I'm going to go back through and look for questions real quick. Is that a meat carving knife? It is, and it's my favorite tool for cutting foam. I also use a bandsaw to cut foam when I'm looking to cut specific shapes. I'll use uh, an electric meat carver to rough cut the foam out, and then I'll take it to the bandsaw and make it a nice clean shape. That's what my mom always used. Yeah, so there's no shortage of electric bread knives or meat carvers at the thrift store. They're usually about less than 10 bucks. Everyone buys them, nobody uses them, so they always get donated. Perfect for cutting foam. It's the perfect, perfect step for cutting foam. So the next step is putting batting on the outside surface of this. So we are going to go back to the cutting table, cut the batting for this, and then come back and put the batting on. And that's going to be it for today. We're going to get foam and batting through. If you're here and you're uh, learning from what it is that I'm doing here, you're enjoying yourself and you're hanging out today, the only thing I ask of you is that you tap on the screen violently and add as many likes to the equation up there as you can. The When you do that, it engages with my content and it sends people to my for it sends my content through the for you page so that people find me they can take classes with me I do in-person upholstery workshops I do virtual upholstery workshops I do private mm. workshops I have um, I have tutorials we have a private Facebook group that you can join for free and if you get any uh, if you're working on a project at home, you get stuck on anything, you can tag me in it and I can help you for free through that group. There's a lot of really accessible ways to learn upholstery from me. Uh, this is one of them. 
the Tutorial Tuesdays is free and you can learn from whatever it is I'm working on at the time. Your live share was one of the best. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I have a lot of fun doing these and I've been working for 2024. I'm working to get these edited down into long form tutorials so I can get it on YouTube. But the editing process takes so long and joining you guys live is the easiest way for me to show you these tutorials. So right now we're doing them on Tuesdays. We might add more to the future. I am already teaching upholstery lessons four days a week and I teach five classes a week. So two on Mondays, one in the morning, one at night. and then and I do Friday, Saturday, Sunday as well. So if you want to come visit Ann Arbor, Michigan, you can book a four-day class, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and hang out with me for four days and maybe even finish peace while you're at it. I can find you a cool place to stay while you're out here. So let's measure this for batting. So we need to measure three panels, one for the seat, two for, or four panels, one for the seat, two for the arms, and one for the seat back. Those are going to be four different things. Oof, too cold up there. You're not kidding. It's like negative something out today but it's supposed to get warmer in the next couple of days and get like over 20 but i agree it's pretty nasty out here you can come to one of my summer retreats that'll be way more fun okay so i usually have my measuring tape around my neck it has disappeared let's find another one okay so the batting that goes on this is going to wrap around the seat. It's going to start down here and it's going to go out the frame to the back. It is not going to wrap under here and staple. I like to keep this edge clean. So it's just gonna staple here to the front and go back. So I need to measure the seat at its longest point from the center from the front to the back because it gets narrower at the sides. And the longest point from the sides where it has to go over this side around and down this side and that's how big of a panel I need to cut for the seat I'm going to do the same thing for the arms I'm going to write these down on the board so that I don't forget them you guys can remember them too so I can just look at the screen if I need to and then we're going to take it to the table and we're going to cut it so this is how we this is how we measure for fabric too if you're measuring your piece uh, your frame, like just bare frame, or if you're measuring it before you take anything off of it, this is a good way to measure it to um, figure out how much material you're going to need. So the way that I'm measuring it is I'm assuming one, fabric comes at a 54 inch width bolt mostly. When you're new, do not assume you can get more than one panel of fabric out of one width of it because you're going to end up needing extra fabric for mistakes and if you forget that you can fit more than one panel in one, then you're going to give yourself a little bit of extra fabric and you're going to be a lot less stressed out. So what I do is I add up the lengths, not the widths, but the lengths of all of these panels and I add them up, I divide them by 36, and then I round up to the nearest yard, and that's how many yards you need. It changes if you have a pattern, because patterns need to be matched, so you're gonna be adding extra fabric for that. You'll need to know the math of the pattern repeat. We're not gonna do that today, we're just measuring for batting. So I'm going to measure the length of all of these. I also have to measure the width, because I do have to cut the width out of my batting. It's like 90 inches wide. So this, oh my goodness. Okay, let's try that again. So first, I'm going to run my measuring tape through the frame until it pokes out the other side. You should be able to clearly get your hands through both pieces of these foam. You don't want it to be locked up. You don't want it to be blocking anything. And then I'm measuring down to the bottom part of the frame in the back, and I'm going to measure down to the bottom part of the frame in the front. And that's my measurement. Now. You need extra material to hold on to with your hands to pull this into place. And the way that I measure that is I add two inches on this side and two inches on the other side. So it's this total measurement from front of the frame here to back of the frame in the same place plus four inches. So here I've got 29 inches plus four inches is going to be 33 inches. So 33 inches this way. If I'm measuring for fabric, I can round that up. That's a yard. I need a yard of fabric to cover in front of this. 33 inches lengthwise by, oh my gosh, there is a extension cord I keep tripping over, sorry guys, 33 inches by 35 plus 4 inches is 39, so 33 inches by 39 inches for the seat, I'm going to write that down on the board. Thirty-three by thirty-nine. 
Now, if this were, if we were measuring for our fabric, we would want to know which direction was 33 and which direction was 39, and be mindful of that when we're adding up all of our panels. So here, I'm going to push this down into the frame at the longest point, which is actually, it's taller in the back than it is in the front. So the longest point is actually in the back. And I'm measuring down to the bottom part of the frame, over the top, and then down to where it touches back here, and I'm going to add 4 inches. So 15 plus 4 is 19 inches, and then it does come back here. It gets overlapped by this, so it is going to come a little bit further back here, and then come around to the front. So what was that? 19 inches by... 19 inches, so a 19 inch square for both arms, 19 by 19 times 2, and now we need to measure for the back. So the back goes down into the frame, to the bottom part of the frame here, up through the center, because it's going to be taller in the center than it is in the back and then around to the back and it's going to attach to the back of the chair. And that is 29 inches plus four inches is um, 33 inches, yeah. So 33 inches by the widest point, which is up here at the top of the chair, and it's gotta come around and attach to the back and then come around front, go across the front and come around and attach to the back. So 33 inches by 33 inches. So 33 inch square for that. Okay, so now I'm ready to go to the cutting table and measure my batting. We can take this for now, we get enough juice to make it over there. Come over to this table and pull out my batting. polyester batting that I got at Joanne Fabrics because I ran out of polyester batting, but I do sell it on my website. I will warn you, however, it comes in a giant bolt that's taller than me and bigger around than you can wrap your head around, hands around. So you got to have a place to store it if you order it from my website. So here, I'm just going to fold that out. And it's not a real squared off edge, so I'm going to square off this edge. first with my T-square so that I get a nice straight line to measure and I want to take it as far over as I can and I'm using this factory edge up here as my guide factory edge is my guide and I'm just doing this to keep the, the line square for everybody who has to use it around me and let's see what we got to do first. We got two 19 inch by 19 inch um, squares. So let's get those out of the way first. So I'm going to go 19 inches down here. 19 times 2 is 38. So in my next mark, I'm going to mark 38 inches down here. I'm going to move this over just a little bit. And I'm going to do square it with this edge. I'm going to do 19 inches and then down to 38. So I can get my two 19 inch squares. Now I can measure in this direction. Square it up with the square line that I've already made. I can measure 19 inches down this edge. 19 inches matching these two points up. And then again, down at the other mark, Now I can connect all of these dots to 
make that final line. and have them ready for my piece. Need a pair of scissors. cutting this off because I'm going to be cutting the extra fabric off anyways. I don't need to waste any time, but I do need to cut it in half. And there is way too much material on this end, so I'm going to cut that piece too. So these are my arms. These are ready to go. Now I can do my C and my C back. My next measurement is 33 by 33. to keep everything spread out cleanly on the table too. So I'm going to measure 33 inches down this side. Move it down a little bit and measure 33 inches down this side. Then I can measure 33 inches on this side. measure 33 inches here. So now I have two dots this way, 33 inches, and this part is ready to be cut out. So the next part is the seat. Seat. We have enough on this end. Oh, we do have enough on this end. Okay, so let me cut this piece square first. So I need 39 inches in this direction. I'm going to measure it from this end this time. 39. It's 40. I'm not even going to bother cutting it. It's just 40 across. And then I need 40 across this way. Then I can mark this line at 39 inches. And mark the same dimension on the far side. It's a 39 inch by 39 inch square. It only needed to be 33 by 33, or 33 by 39. So it's bigger than it needs to be, but that's why we're squared off the batting. And we'll cut off the excess. Actually, that's a lot of extra. So I'm just going to measure 33 inches down, because I don't need to cut it. I want to conserve material, and I don't need to cut that much. 33. 33 on this side. And connect this up. That's a little bit better. And your measure. 
measurements at this stage don't have to be perfect. It just has to be a little bit bigger than what you need. Because you're going to cut off the extra anyway. So we're going to do the seat first, and then we'll do the, the arm sides, and then the seat back last. So I'm going to go through these questions real quick. Your live share is one of the best. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys being here. If you're here, you're learning something, just tap on the screen. No need to send me gifts because I only get fractions of pennies on the dollar for gifts that you send. But when you tap the screen and you like it and engage with this post, it shoots my content out to the For You page. More people see it. They find my classes. They take my classes. And that's how I make a living. Thanks so much, Karen. I like my chair, too. Karen says, nice chair. So the first piece of batting we're going to put is on the seat. We don't need to glue this down. This is going to get stapled down but we need to first make the cuts. The cool thing about this stage is that this is your first practice layer of fabric. So you can make all your practice cuts in this. If they're not perfect, it doesn't matter. Your fabric is gonna cover this up. So this is going to be a really great start into making sure you get all of your cuts perfect before you get to your show fabric. What is the batting made of? I missed that part. This is polyester batting, poly batting. So it's made of plastics. Uh, you can get cotton batting too. It's not as strong or as workable as poly batting, uh, but they have lots of natural options too. You don't have to use poly, but that's what I use. So first, I want to evenly distribute the material on the surface of the seat, which means I want to make sure that there's the same amount of fabric going off all of the sides of it. I need it to reach as far down as the base here. I need it to wrap around. I need it to reach as far down as the base on the other side. It also needs to start down here, wrap around, and reach to the back. So first, I'm gonna fold it in half, and I'm gonna lay it across the chair, and I'm going to try and center. You can mark the center on your chair if you need to, but basically I'm gonna try and center it, and I make sure that there's a little bit extra material in the front here that goes beyond what I need it so that I make sure it's long enough. And then I'm just gonna open it up so that it spreads across the seat evenly. So before I do anything, before I tuck it, before I staple it, I just wanna spread this out nice and cleanly across the surface of the seat. It's important for you to evenly distribute the material before you put any staples or make any cuts or tuck it. So I'm just going to spread this out so first it's flat on the seat. I'm going to flip this around too because the fabric that I'm using is light colored and I don't want to see that sharpie. I'm also going to flip it to the back so you can't see it. So, so long as I have enough material to cover the bottom, it's going to get stapled here and cut flush with the frame here and then the rest of it can push back. I also need the sides to be long enough to wrap around the sides. So I'm watching out for that before I fuse anything down. One side of this material is very fuzzy and the other one has a bit more of a sturdy surface and that's this side. So everything is flat here first, then I'm going to pre-tuck these edges into the seat. I'm not tucking the length down, I'm just tucking where it is next to the seat. And I want to make sure that it's nice and smooth and in its place. This way it locks it in so it doesn't move before you make your cuts. So I'm doing that by the arms and I'm doing that at the back. If it's pre-tucked in those gaps, then you can't cut it too far and you don't have to stress out about your cuts. So that's done. The next step is to make the cuts around the barriers. So we have lots of barriers in this. Let me bring it around to the side so you can see. We have these pull through spots that this material has to get through right here. So we need to make cuts around this barrier so that the material can come through the pull through spot and come through on this other side and cover up this foam. So that's the way we're gonna make these cuts right now. And the way we do that is to make a Y cut. 
and I'm going to show you how that's done. I'm just going to get this a little bit further up. Now remember, this is your first practice layer of material that you're putting on your um, on your chair. So this is your first practice cut. So the first thing I want you to do is make sure that your material is cleanly folded away from the barrier that you're cutting at. It's cleanly folded this way, not just bunched up and tossed this way, but cleanly folded so that that fold goes up against the barrier. We're looking to cut around this part of the arm right here. It's about an inch wide. So it's not a very big cut. I'm also pre-tucking this down in between the two pieces of foam so that I don't make my cut too long. The cut that I wanna make is going to be straight for the middle of this part of the frame, which is only about this wide. So I'm going right for the middle of that. A straight line right for the middle of that barrier, which is the arm in this case. So that's first things first. Then I put two fingers on right next to the foam and I make a dot next to my fingers. Now that width is arbitrary, it can be anything, but I always have two fingers on me at all times, so that's the measurement that I use. The next thing I'm gonna do is make a line from this dot to this edge of the leg where the foam is because that's where it has to start going around. I don't wanna go outside that foam because then there's gonna be a gap between the material and the foam where you can see the frame. I want to go just inside the edge of the foam so that there is no gap. And then I'm gonna make a line from this dot to the other side of that leg, which is only about an inch over, all the way down to the foam. Now my next step is to cut straight up this line and then to split that cut into two where I just made those lines so that it can get around this barrier and go through the pull through spots. So I'm going to make these cuts before I tuck anything because this is batting and it's very fragile and if I start tucking it too early I'm going to ruin it and have to replace it. So I'm just going to make the cut. Once I get to that dot, I can start going off to the other side. Now I can do this without marking it with a sharpie now. I want my scissors to stop cutting right, these aren't sharp enough at the tip, right when it hits the foam. It's already tucked into the foam so it can't go too far. And then same thing for here, I'm going to stop right when it gets to the foam. So I have this little Y now that gets tucked in between the two pieces of foam and makes a nice clean edge. And this part goes off around that side of the arm, and this part will be able to get tucked down there, but not before I cut it at the leg in the back. Now, if you guys have been here the whole time, you've seen the leg in the back is at an angle this way. So this piece of material has to be folded up against that angle of the leg, which is the broad face of it goes this way. So I fold it down, I pre-tuck it a little bit, and then I'm going to make that line. I will feel down here for where that leg is. I can feel one side of it here and I can feel one side of it here. So my line is going straight for the center of that first. Then I got my two fingers next to the foam to make that dot. And then I want this line to go straight down for this edge and I can feel it in there with my finger and then I'm feeling for that other side here, and I'm making that line go straight there. Now I can make these cuts without drawing these lines, but you might want to make them just to make sure you don't cut too long. So cutting straight up and then down the one part of the V or Y, and then down the other part. Now this part gets tucked in between the two pieces of foam, and this part is free to get tucked through the back. Now this is a lot of extra material. We don't need it. We just need it to go through the frame and touch the outside. So I'm going to cut off extra so that I don't have to wrestle with this to tuck it in. But this flap is now ready to be tucked on the inside. Let me see if we can get a little further back so you can see. I always lead with this end. If you start to tuck through here, it's going to get all blocked up in here. So I pull it out a little bit, lead with this end and then pull it through the other side and then I'll come through on the other side to watch it come through. And try and pull it through as cleanly as possible. If it starts to tear apart at this stage, it's fine so long as the integrity is held on the seat. It doesn't need to come through and staple down here because you're going to have so many more materials that come through. It just needs to come through and tuck here. And I'm going to trim it to the side of 
the frame. So, here's my scissors. Here they go. So this, I'm just going to trim right up to the edge of the frame. I don't need to staple this layer down because the fabric's going to hold it in place. And if I build up too many staple layers here, there's going to put too many holes in the frame. It's not going to hold everything down. And this area is going to get too thick. You're going to be using the thickest staples that you can use. And it's still not going to go through all the frame. So you don't need to staple the batting down at this point. You can just have it come right up to the edge and trim it off. Now I need to do the cuts on the other side. And I'm not going to mark it this time because for me it's difficult to do. Okay, so this side first. Push it, tuck it right, pre-tuck it into that side and fold it up along that side. Then I'm going to make a cut straight for the center of this arm and then Y cut off to either edge of it. straight for the center and if you didn't leave a mark you can feel with your fingers I can feel the outer edge here and I can feel the inner edge here for where I need to make my cuts but I also know it with my brain and I've been practicing for a long time so I know where to make them so this little Y gets tucked right in there and then this can come over to this side and this is almost ready to go here but we have to make the cut in the back first so for this back so I'm going to pre-tuck it back there, doggy ear it back so it's folded up against single that leg. We're going to cut through the center and then Y cut off to the sides. Now I have all this extra material that I don't need, so I'm gonna, I just need enough to tuck back through there. So I'm going to remove the excess so that I don't have to wrestle this. And the same goes for the back. This is a lot of extra material that I don't need. I just need it to go through to the other side. So I'm going to trim all of this back. And now I'm ready to tuck. So leading with this edge, I can tuck it through to the back. I can do the same thing back here. And then we're going to come around to this side to pull it out through the clearances on the outside of the frame. Try not to pull too hard. This material is not very strong. It will fall apart in your hands, as it did right here. And then I can just, once I have it all the way through, I can trim it up to the frame. If you do this and it starts to pull apart on top, you may find yourself needing to replace that material on top. So let's look in the back. That's the last bit. And we're always trimming off the excess material as we go because we don't want to trim through three or four layers of this after we get moving. We want it to look nice and clean the whole way through. So just trimming that back to the frame. Looks great. Awesome. So the next part is going to be these arms. And that is essentially done the same exact way, only at the arm level. So this is my arm fabric. It's a square, so it doesn't really matter which direction. It has to overlap in this direction, so I need it to come a little bit further out here. And there needs to be enough to tuck through here and pull through, and then this part needs to come around the top. So I'm going to place this first so that I have it in the right area. 
pre-tuck this a little bit into the sides and then I just have to make a cut up here for this barrier to allow this to get tucked into the back. Same cut for that barrier as we did the seat. So this gets the same Y cut going right for the barrier that we just did for the seat. Straight for the middle and then off to the side edges and you can feel where that is with your fingers too. The little V gets tucked in between and that'll finish off that area and then this bit can go on that side and this bit can get tucked through. There is a little cut that will have to get made for the one side of the leg it's going to encounter here and also this material is too much material so I can trim it back and then leading with the edge I can tuck it back. You want to keep this pull through spot clear. You don't want to just cram batting through there. You want to make sure that it is cleanly going through to the other side so that you can stick your fingers through there because you're going to need to stick your fabric in there too. I'm going to show you what that looks like. You can use a piece of plastic or a ruler, um, a paint scraper, lots of different things to tuck through this side. So here, I just need to make sure that my fingers can come through this side. And you'll see it's already getting entangled in some of this batting. Mm -hmm. So it's tough to get it to come through sometimes. But so long as that path remains clear, I can get my fabric through it. So this we're going to staple around this way, but we're not going to do that now. We're just going to get the arms on, staple everything at the same time. So that piece is on. The other thing I'll say is that this is a harsh edge and sometimes you might see that harsh edge even if another piece of batting is overlapping it. So I'm just going to tear away at the edge so that it feathers out and it gets real thin so you can't see it where it layers up there. And then we're going to staple all this down this way nice and clean. But first let's get the other arm on. And then after I do that arm, I'll answer your guys' questions. So, first we place it. It needs to overlap in the back here. Pre-tuck it this way. It needs to have enough material to wrap around this side. This is way bigger than what we need it. But it's a great start for when we're doing, uh, when we're doing things for the first time. So we have more fabric than we need, more material than we need, so we make sure we don't mess up. So everything's pre-tucked, ready to go. I'm going to make a cut for this barrier right here, the Y cut that we just did on the other side. And that's a cut straight for the center of the leg, for the arm, and then a Y cut to the outer edges of that. And now I can't see it, but you can reach in there and feel it with your fingers. So this little Y gets tucked in between those pieces of foam, and this can go on this side, and then the rest of that can get tucked into the chair. So I'm going to pre-tuck that again. And I know I have to make a cut for this side. And I can actually rip this off now because I don't need this material. So that will feather back. And then trim this back because it doesn't need to be this long. And then tuck this through to the pull through spot in the back. Make sure that my fingers can go all the way through so that my fabric can get through. I'm not blocking any of those clearances. <coughs> so we have two arms in the seat ready. You'll notice I've not put one staple in here yet. And that's because we don't want to put too many staples in before we're ready and we end up having to take them out. And we'll go back through. It looks like we've got a handful of questions here now. So I'm going to read those first. What is the batting made of? I missed that part. It's poly batting. It's made of polyester plastics. Uh, 
good teachers are rare. Thank you so much for what you do. I wish I could learn in person. Thank you so much for your generous compliment. Um, I really enjoy teaching a lot, and I want to teach more people. I've taught over 300 people in just over the past year, so uh, it's been pretty exciting for me here. More people need to learn how to do this. There's not enough tr uh, skilled trades people in this field, so we need a lot more upholsters. Uh, you don't have to live near me to take my classes. I do live virtual upholstery workshops. This is free, but I do uh, bring your own project workshop on Monday evenings that's open to up six attend up to six attendees so you can bring your own project zoom in from home and I'll walk you through step by step to complete your piece but I also do virtual private workshops too so if you want just you and me to work through a project together I can help you there I have a club on Facebook a, a virtual upholstery club which is just a private group on Facebook called the local upholstery club and in there you can post pictures of your work if you're stuck you can tag me in the comments and I will comment on it and help answer your question but there are upholsters there from every level of experience from looky loos to people who have been doing it 50 years or more so it's a really good supportive place for you to come and uh, and get other people to help you out why do you apply the poly sheets over the foam? That's a really great question. So I put the poly over the foam because it puts an, a layer of air in between the foam and the fabric. If you put fabric just on the foam, which you can do, it can tend to look really flat and it really grips to that. But the batting softens it, puts a little bit of air in it, and makes it look just a little more floofy. That's a really great question. I installed carpet for 35 years. I'm done. I think this is something I would be good at. I think that that skill is transferable. I've installed carpet before, just my own DIY experience, and I did really well because uh, I have this experience under under my belt. I think it's transferable experience. Bone folders. I don't know what that means, but I think it is like for tucking, a bone folder. Uh, I made museum mounts for a hot minute and it was also similar fun love your work thank you so much heather i appreciate your compliments do you know if you are headed anywhere west for your classes yeah i'd love to attend i am in negotiations with um diy cave in bend oregon right now to come out potentially for two weekends in a row if you want me to come to your town find a maker space or an event space or a place a, like a crafty space equivalent that I can set up shop in. If you make the connection between me and that maker space and they bring me in, you can come attend the virtual, or not the virtual, sorry, the weekend upholstery camp for free. So connect me with the maker space and if I end up coming out there, you can attend the whole camp session for free with me. It's a whole weekend long. <laughs> I wrapped a lot of weird stuff with carpet, I bet, I bet. We need a ton of new upholstery techs. Yeah, there's uh, not enough people in the industry to keep up with the demand. Most businesses are looking to hire people, but there's n nobody out there who knows how to do it because there's no trade schools. They can't afford to train you because it sets them back weeks on projects. So it's really difficult to train someone while you're in production, which is why I sort of am offering these like upholstery classes as well as this stuff on TikTok to sort of give you an exposure to the upholstery industry if you were to walk into an upholstery shop with zero experience on anything and say, hey, I will pull staples, I will work for you for free if you just show me how to do this, nine times out of the time they're going to tell you no and they're going to send you out the door because it costs money to slow down and teach you how to do this. If you come in with some experience and you're just like, hey, look, I've been pulling staples for years, I know how to sew box cushions, I know how to do this, I'm self-taught, but I can learn really quickly all the ropes, they're more likely to bring you in for that type of experience because you have some exposure into it already. So that's a that's something to think about. It's hard to find a trade school for upholstery. It is. There are not a lot of professional um, uh, learning educational opportunities in the United States, maybe less than a dozen of them, and I'm not considered one of them. So they're, the trade school for upholstery, they don't even have that anymore in the United States because everything went overseas and was being mass produced overseas. The upholstery industries that, mm -hmm. us, that um, sorry, I'm getting texts from my kids. The upholstery businesses that survived here in the United States are the people are now aging out of the business. You don't see a lot of new upholstery businesses getting started because the education is not being passed down. New people are learning it. They're not teaching it out of shops because they can teach you and then you can take it to your garage and you can do it for more money there. So they're not trying to breed competition. But because of it, we're running out of skilled trades people to do this. And now there's a high demand for upholstery and not enough people to do it. So we have like year-long wait lists.
lists and things of that nature. So if you want to learn how to make a little bit of extra money, learn how to do upholstery. You are a great instructor. You make it look easy. Thank you so much. Everything is easy with practice, and I've been doing this for over a decade now, so keep that in mind. I am self-taught. I taught myself by reverse engineering, by taking things apart, figuring out how they were put back together, putting it back together. I made a lot of mistakes. I learned a lot from those experiences. I got paid every step of the way because everybody was very interested in me learning how to do this so I could do it for them, so um, something to keep in mind. It's difficult to learn, but with practice, you could get really, really good. So if you guys are here and you're enjoying this lesson and uh, you want to continue to help me provide accessible upholstery education to everyone, the only thing I ask while you're here is that you tap on the screen as violently as possible, as fast as possible for as long as you can. A little meter is going to show up here in the upper left hand corner of like a heart and it'll race itself to the end. When it gets to the end, it'll throw you a party. When you do that, you're engaging with my posts if you're not asking questions or sharing it already. It sends out all my stuff out to the For You page. People find me. They take my classes or they come to my weekend upholstery camps and take my classes and that's how I run my business. So when you guys hear you're single-handedly helping to reestablish the upholstery industry. I reupholstered my couch. I couldn't afford a new one, so I took a leap. I learned a lot. Yeah, yeah. And it's it is definitely less expensive to reupholster it yourself, but there is it's hard work. So so don't get me wrong, it's extremely, extremely hard work. So the next step we're going to do, and I'm going to do it now that we've got a ton of people coming on here, is we're going to put the piece of batting on the back. We've already done the seats. We've already done the sides. We've not added one staple yet. We're just evenly distributing the material first before we add staples so we don't have to remove staples later on. Deborah said she's loved to learn. Deborah, stay tuned. We're learning a lot here today, but I also teach virtual upholstery workshops, both uh, group lessons and private lessons. I have in-person classes here. You can come to me in Ann Arbor, Michigan. They're set out uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, so you could come for a weekend if you wanted and stay. And my classes are buy three, get one free. So if you buy four classes, you're only paying for three, and for three classes, it's $225. So it's a really good rate to come and take a weekend full of upholstery classes if you want to come out and visit. Next step is getting the batting on here. Just like these side seats, we need enough length on the bottom to be able to tuck through, and enough length on the top to be able to wrap around and staple, and enough length on the sides to staple to the sides. So, this is a square. It doesn't matter which direction we put it on. But I start by folding it in half, and I try and adjust that fold to the center. I make sure that I have a little bit of material down here, enough to tuck through and tuck to the back. If this was your show fabric, you want enough to tuck through and staple to the back. So you want to make sure it's long enough to do that. Here, I just need it to tuck through to the back. I don't need to staple it anywhere. So now I can open it up. I need to make sure that this material is long enough to go around the sides. It is. And the same over here. This material is a lot longer on this side, so I didn't have it exactly centered. I'm going to move it over just a little bit. So I'm not wrestling with it. And then I'm going to press it down to the bone and pre-tuck it, just the edge of it here, around the sides at the bottom. I do want this material to smooth out on the surface, but I'm not super concerned about that until I have to staple it to the outside. Right now, I'm just getting it sort of like spread out and evenly distributed. So now it's spread out and evenly distributed. There's a couple of cuts I have to make. One, I have to make cuts by this arm so that this material can go around to the sides and this material can be free. It's going to get cut off, but so that it would be able to go on this side. So I need to make a cut there and a cut there on that arm. And I also need to make cuts for the legs at the bottom. So that's what we're going to do. First, we're going to make these cuts. And the way that we make these cuts, you'll have to see from this side, is that this cut is actually going to come straight down for the ditch here. I need extra material so that it overlaps here. So my cut is going to come a little bit down further here so that this material is wide. If it was my show fabric, I would need it to fold under right here. So I'm going to cut from here and I'm going to cut to this ditch and I'm going to stop right about here. So from here to here. Now you can always cut more, but you can't cut less. So take your cuts a little bit at a time. The goal is to get this fabric to come around this way. This fabric is going to get removed. 
but there needs to be complete coverage from these two areas right here. Those need to overlap and cover, and that looks great. So that cut's done. We're gonna come back over this side and do it on this side. And if I were to bring this up, fold it to the side, I could make a cut straight for here. I need it to come lower than this arm so that it will overlap that arm. So here, and I'm just cutting right into that ditch. Just like that. So it overlaps on this side, comes around, these sides overlap here, this whole area is covered. So it's gonna go that way. And now I have this, a lot of extra material here. So now I need to make cuts for these legs. And I only need to narrow this flap so that it can fit between the insides of the legs here because that's the opening starts here and ends here. So I need to just make this that narrow. So I'm making those first two cuts for those legs. And then I have all of this extra material, but that has to overlap here, just like we prepared the other one. I'm just going to tear, I think you can see it better on this side, from this cut to this cut, I'm just going to tear it so that it thins out in that area and it felts and goes smooth into the arm. And you might be able to see that better on the other side when I do that. So this extra material is gone. I pre-tuck this and make sure I don't do it too far. And from this cut to the bottom cut, I'm going to tear away that material so that it felts itself, it smooths it out, and you can't see that transition when I put the fabric on. So now this little flap goes up all the way back. And you want to make sure that that area stays clear so that you can still tuck fabric back there. And now we have everything placed and ready for staples. So the first place I'm going to add staples is going to be to the center back here. I need to pull this down and add a staple so that I can lock in the curve of the front. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Just like when we did the material on the seats, we're locking it down in the sta with staples in the centers first. So in the center and the top, if this were fabric, I would be locking it in the center and the bottom, but this doesn't lock down on the bottom. We can't lock down anything in the pull-through spots right now. Anything that pulls through there, we can't staple because fabric still has to go through there, and we'll close it off if we put staples there. So the first staple we're going to put is up in the center here. And the reason for that is because this chair curves, and I need to keep this curve. If I pull it at the sides first, it's gonna pull this material out and it's gonna be straight across that curve and that's not going to touch the foam. I need it to touch the foam. So the best way to do that is pull it straight up through the center and then back. And then I'm gonna put my first staple in the center in the back. I'll show you how I want to do those staples too. Now, if this is your first time doing upholstery or you haven't been doing this long, and putting those first staples in really make you sweat, then you can use a temporary staple. And the way you do that is instead of stapling flat down into the surface, you're going to tip it to the side, and it's only going to put, shoot in like one side of that staple all the way, and the other side is going to stick out a little bit so that you can get your staple removal under there and remove it easily without damaging fabric. So this, I'm going to pull, and I also want to smooth that foam down. Like right now, it's one inch thick, and it's a very harsh edge, but I want to smooth that down so it creates a nice rounded edge. This is a hard material to pull super tight because it starts to break apart and fall apart, so you have to be careful with this. I need to match this tension all the way across. I need this line to stay straight, but right now, I just need one staple, and I'm going to do that. Um, the staple is going to go right here at the edge of the frame, and it's going to go diagonal. When I put all my staples in, they're going to be diagonal like this, and that's going to flatten out this area so that it doesn't stick out when I put my final panel on the back here. So, very important. Pull in the center. Pull down so that I can see the edge of the frame right here. I can feel it. And then I'm just going to put two 
diagonal staples right there. I'll get close so you can see what I mean by diagonal right there. Now those are go almost all the way up to the edge here and this row when I put all of them in are, is going to be a straight line that goes across and that if that line isn't straight then it's not going to look straight when you go to put your fabric on there. So that's right I use the frame as my guide to make that line go straight across. Right now we just need the center of that done and then the next part is going to be the center on the sides. So I have the center locked down here and now I want to pull from the sides and lock the centers down that way, which is going to get rid of this. Hold on. You don't want to see the whole chair while I do this. So I got a lock down in the center on the top, and now I need to lock it down the center and the sides. So I can pull this so that I can get that little wrinkle out, and right on the center. I can pull this around. I'm looking for that same tension that I did in the back. And then just lock one diagonal staple towards the edge on the side over here. And I'm going to do the same thing on this side. Let me get my phone plugged in too for holding still. Because I'm still losing juice. You are a fantastic teacher. You explained why. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I am using, I see someone said, what type of staple gun are you using? I'm using a pneumatic stapler. This is a BEA or BUA or BIA. I don't know how to pronounce it. I've never heard it said out loud. This is like a $400 staple gun. You don't need a $400 staple gun. Pneumatic is best because you can control the pressure. Electric uh, staplers, you can't control the pressure. And then my gun is actually a 22 gauge gun with a half inch crown on it. That is a much thinner stapler than the staplers you're gonna get at Home Depot. And that's because the staple is damaged less. So I have my Staple in the center over here. I'm going to use the smoothing motion to make sure I get out any excess, and I'm going to drop a staple in the center on this side. Diagonal, right there. Looks good. So I've got the top locked down. That looks good. We're going to come back to that. Now I want to do the arms. So I'm going to do in the center up here, pulling this down the same way we did on top, and I'm putting a diagonal along the edge on the top. I'm going to do the same thing with the arm on this side. The air compressor is loud, so I'm going to wait for that to go off before I say anything else. Are your diagonal staples permanent? Um, so I'm using permanent staples, but I suggest if you're new with this, you use a temporary staple so that you can get it out easily. This material can get damaged by staple pullers really easy. So you wanna give yourself a way out and you don't wanna put too many staples in until you're sure everything is in the right place. So right now, I'm just doing those center staples to keep those locked in place so nothing moves. I'm going to do now this, the center in the front, it's going to roll around front and I'm going to take a little there too. Now for the front, this batting is going to wrap all the way around and it's going to get cut off at the edge here. So my staples are actually going right here close to the edge when I do that. So the first thing I do is pull this arm fabric down so that it goes down in between the foam and everything smooths out there so that I can see that that's nice and taut. Smooth this around to the side and then drop two staples in the center of the arm here. using the diagonal direction again to keep this flattened out. Looks good. And now we can work on this seat. So this seat, the only place that it staples down is actually to the front and around the side. So we're going to do this first and then we're going to go around and finish up the arms in the back. 
So this gets stapled to the front, only right down to the bottom edge, and we're going to use those diagonal staples. So I'm going to start in the center. I'm not pulling this part down too far because this is a nice rigid edge and I want to keep this nice and straight. If I pull too far, it's going to go like this. I don't want to do that. I just want to pull it down taut, not too tight. I have to pull it under the frame even though I'm only going to staple it to the face so that I can see the edge of the frame because these staples need to be diagonal and sort of next to each other and along the edge of that frame. Now I'm going to zoom this in on the bottom so you can see the direction of these staples. This is how the staples are going to go throughout the whole project. This will give you an opportunity to kind of see how they get lined up. So I'm gonna actually work my way from this center staple down to this leg. I'm not gonna go around the corner, but I do wanna work my way from the center staple down. I'm using this smoothing motion so that I can smooth all of the excess material down so that it's taut, but not too tight. If you pull too tight and someone sits on it, it can rip away from the staples. You don't want that. I just need it to be nice and smooth. So you can see my first two staples there already. I'm going to take these, they're gonna be within a half inch of each other, and they're gonna go diagonal all the way across. Now what happens when you do it across and you're making this nice and straight is that this is flattening this out. So when your fabric comes around, it gradiates and it smooths out and looks nice and smooth and clean along this edge. If these staples are crooked, you're gonna see that. You wanna make sure that they stay straight. So I'm going to take this down to just before the leg here because there are some folds and cuts I have to do around that leg and we're going to do those at the same time. But I am making sure to keep this line nice and straight. All my tension should be the same. Ran out of I'm using a 3 8 inch staple for this. You need a nice long staple to get through all the layers and materials and to make sure that it bites onto that frame real good. Now here, we're going, oh, I don't know if you can see this side. Now we don't want to go all the way inside the edge here. The only material that gets stapled in here is going to be the fabric. So these staples just go just above that. And now we're going to come around this corner this way where we have to figure out what to do here. Now this is a lot of material. If we fold this back, it's going to get real bulky here and you're going to see this through your fabric. Let me get this tucked out of the way. So we need to resolve that first. So first I'm going to pull straight down this way and I'm going to lock my staples on the sides here, right there. So I pulled that out of the way. I'm getting this side area taken care of first. So the same way we did the front, which is diagonal staples all the way around the bottom edge. I'm going to stop right when I get to the leg. And then this actually is going to fold around to the front. But this is a lot of extra material. I don't need this. So first, I'm going to fold it around to the front, and I'm just going to drop a couple of staples up this edge of the leg. And that's going to allow me to make a cut so that I can get rid of some of the extra fabric. So I'm going to make that cut straight up the outside edge of those staples that I just put in there. And try not to cut through all of your layers of material. So I made that cut straight up this way. All of this is flat and clean. This can actually get cut clean to the frame too. I just line up my scissors with the edge of the frame and trim everything that goes below the frame back. So that's extra. And now I have this here. Now if this was your show fabric, you would want to fold this back and, and put it like this, or you would sew it, miter it, sew it that way but this is just the batting fabric so this I don't need to fold over I just need it to go to this outside edge and I'm going to run a couple extra staples up the edge there in a straight direction so that it doesn't flatten out that area 
and then I can just trim this right to the stuff. Just like that. And then everything that comes below the frame on this side will get trimmed back. And the reason I don't wrap this under the frame is because when you wrap it under the frame, it creates a nice soft area down here. It's really hard to get a sharp edge with your trim that way. So I like to make my trim look nice and clean. So I keep everything trimmed back above or just at the edge of that frame. So now we're gonna do that to this area. I'll lift this up so you guys can see a little bit better. So let's do that very quickly around this. So I'm gonna do this side first. Get that out of the way. So that gets pulled down straight. And then I can put my staples along the edge on the frame. And then it wraps very quickly this way and then it gets pulled over on top so it's sort of like wrapping a present very easy when you're doing it with your show fabric this is how easy it is this is the practice layer of cutting and folding so uh, you can practice with this layer this folds over and I'm gonna put a couple of staples up the edge here just on the wood part that way I can cut right up the inside edge of those staples and this piece is free to go on the other side so now I'm going to put my staples from the center here and over I always work my way from the center out because it evenly distributes the fabric that way and then I'm going to continue those diagonal staples across the front this way make sure that this line stays straight all the way across. A lot of people tend to pull too hard on the corners which can make it look sad and go down. So make sure you're keeping that same amount of tension on the side. And then here I just want a couple of straight staples of the edge to hold that in place. And then this can get trimmed off straight to the edge. I can run my scissors along the bottom of the frame this way and trim that. None of this batting material should go into these channels because that's going to clog up those channels and make it difficult to make this area look clean. So now I can just come back through here. I'm just putting my scissors on the bottom of my frame and I'm running it up the frame as a guide. So none of this material wraps underneath because that'll make it look lumpy and make it look, make it hard to clean that area up with your trim. So that looks good. So now we can, basically we're gonna do the same thing to the arms now. A little bit different. So let's take a look at this one, what this one looks like. A lot of extra material here. We have our center staple, so we're gonna work our way from the center out to the arm. And we're gonna do that by smoothing this down, watching this line, making sure that stays straight, for here, I can just hold this whole thing down and take my staples this way. So I'm running my staples diagonally along this edge of my frame, and I am running them in a straight line to keep that area nice and flat. And then from the center here, I can go back and do the same thing. So I can use this like wiping motion to sort of wipe everything into place and to keep it looking straight. You should, none of this material should overlap itself. If it's wrinkling and overlapping itself, it's going to make it look really messy and sloppy under your fabric. So this should be nice and smooth. As soon as you're done stapling, come back through with the scissors and you're gonna cut that right up to the staples. You don't want it any excess falling down below the staples because it'll stick out like a lump and you'll see it underneath your material. This way the diagonal of the staples flattens out this whole space, makes it look nice and clean for the material that's gonna go on top of it. So we need to do the same thing but around the front here. I can cut this off and do that. So let's look at the face of this arm. We're doing the same thing to the front, but we're stapling it along this edge right here. So 
So first we're going to get rid of all of the extra material we don't want to wrestle with, anything that sticks out side of here. We don't want anything wrinkling up or buckling up in this area because it'll end up looking sloppy. For this part, this part of the arm can fold down and staple here so that we're getting a nice smooth area there. And then, just like we did on the sides here, we're going to cut along inside that staple so that this material can come cleanly this way. And then we're just going to wipe to smooth that out. I pull it over the edge so that I can see the edge of the frame so that I can align the staples properly. And then I'm just going to take that all the way down to the bottom. And once that's done, I can use the edge of my frame, guide my scissors there, and then just trim it all the way back like this. I have this uh, batting here we didn't lock down that's coming from the seat that I can do diagonal staples right down on the edge of the arm. These staples have to come to the other side of this arm. I don't know if you can see it. These staples here have to come, like the panel that comes here is going to come straight here, so these staples have to be on the other side of this. It doesn't matter for this layer because everything's going to get covered up, but if I were to put my staples here, you would see that line under the fabric. Here is going to be a natural seam, so that's where I would put my staples. So this arm is done, this seat is done, we're going to come over to the other side and we're going to work on this arm next. So just like we did on the other side, let's get this set down. I've already got my staples in the middle here. I already have them stapled in the middle here. I'm going to work from my middle out this way and the middle back that way. I'll probably do the back first. I want to make sure that I'm smoothing this out at the same tension that this was smoothed out so that this line looks nice and straight. And to do that, I can just sort of pull that material down a little bit at a time. I like to grab it in the middle between here and here. I like to grab it in the middle there. And then I can use my hand as a smoothing motion to sort of get everything over there well. At no point should you have a cluster of this material overlapping itself because that is going to make it look real lumpy and sloppy. So from this center point on to the other end, I'm going to do the same thing. Keeping that line of diagonal staples nice and straight and keeping those staples all within a half inch of each other is going to help make that look nice and clean. So this side is done. I'm going to clear out all the excess material. Again, I'm cutting right up to the edge of the staples. If I cut below the staples, then this material is going to flip up and it's going to leave a little lump there that you'll be able to see underneath your fabric. So I'm really cutting right as close to those staples as I can get. And now we can do the front piece. And you guys are going to see how clean this is starting to look when come up to the front. So this piece comes around this way. We're going to staple it all the way up to that side. I accidentally put a staple over here before thinking that I wanted it to come out to the edge so you can see that. First, this piece folds down to smooth out the foam on that side. I'm just going to put two staples there. Then I make a trim up against that staple so that this material can come this way. So now I can smooth it out this way. diagonal staples all the way in, get this pulled down, and I can do the same thing from the bottom. So now all of this material can get trimmed up. Straight to the frame. Nothing should be wrapping around the frame if you can avoid it. Here we can't avoid it because there's nowhere to staple to up top. So here it had to come around. 
same way for the seat back. And then this is the same way. Staple that down, trim off anything that looks like it might stick out. Get a little haircut. Let's back up and see what we've got. So that's really, really taking shape there. It's really already starting to smooth out. So I'm going to do the same thing to the sides, and then I'll take you to the back for the back of it. So the first thing I'm going to do is work my way up these sides. I want to smooth out from the center this way, and I want to make sure that I keep this line straight all the way through. There's already staple here. My focus is down here at the other end, where I'm pulling both down in this direction and out in that direction to make sure that it gets evenly distributed. Staples on this side to keep everything flat, only this material was wrapping all the way to the back. So now I'm going to work my way from the center to the top. And do this. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to work on this corner because it's a rounded corner. So I'm going to pull right at the corner first and make one staple. I'll bring this around for the second corner so you guys can see what I'm doing more clearly. And then, right where this fabric folds up in that corner, I'm going to make another relief cut so that it can come out this way. But this is too big. So I can cut that to get it out of my way and move it. So now this I can pull. I'm pulling up in this direction and back so that this can get smooth. And when we go to the other side, I'll do that in front of back so you guys can see on the back side. You can see me do the other side from the back. Whoa. There we go. We have a little bit of extra material up here that we can probably tear away. It's just in the front here. That's good. So we have it stapled in the center in the back. Next staple is going to come down here. So I'm pulling down and back this way to smooth it out. Diagonal staples all the way to that edge. I can see through this material so I can see the edge, but you can also feel for it with your hands. And the idea is to keep this line nice and straight. So you can smooth it in this direction. Now I'm going to come up to this corner. This is the tricky part because I need to keep this corner nice and I need to keep this corner nice and rounded. So this part comes directly from the corner and pulls down this way. So this will fold up this way. This will fold up this way. When you're doing it with fabric, you're going to have little pleats there. That's fine. Pulling this and I'll put one diagonal staple in the center and then I can cut up so that this folds out this way when it comes back around. This is a bunch of extra material that I don't need and I can fold over this way. So I have this staple down here. Now I can start smoothing this side out. So I'm going to work my way from the center up so I can make sure that I keep Line nice and straight. You see these tables are pretty close to each other. They're all within like a half inch of each other. And that's to help keep that area nice and flat. This will get cut off directly next to those staples so that nothing sticks up. I might even be able to get closer than this. 
it's like giving it a little haircut. You don't want any bulkiness sticking up and you want to remove every excess layer that you can before it gets covered up with another layer. Because it gets more difficult to remove when you're removing like three or four layers of material. Of various materials. Oh, it looks like I missed a corner. And now this is all free to come down. But this is the tricky part because this has got to get nice and smoothed out. Deb. Debbie's here. Deb made it. Hi, Deb. She misses it all the time. I'm going back through to look at the comments just to see what you guys got before I get crazy. And... Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Happy New Year. Good to see you. I always love when you join these lives. Hi, Deb. Thanks for joining. Okay, so we are about to do the top half of this chair now. I'm trying to get this tall enough so you guys can see the shape that it's got to create. This is as tall as I can go. So maybe that'll be good. I already have a lock down in the center because this is concave and I had to lock down the center to keep that curve. And I've already got everything spread out to the side. So I'm actually going to take this from the center and work my way out to the side so that I can, not only it gets evenly distributed, but that I can really control that shape here. So I need all of this tension to match the same tension I did on the center or else this is going to look lumpy. And if it looks lumpy with this part of the material, it's going to look lumpy with the fabric. So I'm just doing this like a couple inches at a time to make sure that I can smooth that really good. This batting is not going to be able to take a lot of friction or play because it is fragile and it will tear apart. So you have to be real careful about how to manipulate it to make sure that it stays intact. Now, if you don't get all the pressure down with this layer, your fabric layer will pull it down well for you too. But this is the sculpting layer of your project. So you do want to make sure that you're creating a nice clean shape with this layer. That looks good. So now I can take it from this direction and go back. This line looks nice and straight. You guys might see that shape a little bit easier when we come through this way. So this, I'm patting down the shape to get it the same tension. I'm just working my way from the center back. looks good. That's a nice clean shape. That's what we're looking for. So now I can take off all of this excess material and that is all we can do for today you guys. Pretty good. We have to get this painted before we get the fabric on it because I don't want to get paint on the fabric. I do not like painting after fabric. So let me take you for a stroll around the chair. You can see what we did. Hi Kim, Happy New Year. I got here at a good point, helping me with my wingback chair. Oh great, well this is, we are nearing the end. I'm learning, but I'm also falling asleep because your voice is soothing. Thank you, I guess, I guess. All right, I'm gonna flip this around. We can take a stroll around this chair. Okay, so this is what we ended up with. So this was a naked frame this morning when we started, and now it is uh, got all the foam and all the batting on it. And this chair is ready for fabric, and it's going to sit until the fabric gets here because I ordered it custom from Spoonflower. So here, where all the staples are, they're nice and flat, so this shape stays nice and clean as it goes around. We have minimal material wrapping around the frame to the back side because this area needs to stay clean when we put the fabric on there. These areas are all cut 
clear of extra material. We have where these two panels overlap are feathered right here so that you can't see that transition once you get the fabric on. It really did turn out very nice. And then that shape at the top of the chair is nice and clean too. This looks really good. I'm very happy with how this turned out. So we have got a lot of likes here. I think we can get a lot more. I'm going to stick around to answer a couple questions. But what I would like you guys to do, if you're here, if you're learning something, if you enjoyed hanging out with me here today, what I would like you to do is tap the screen as violently as possible for as long as you possibly can for the next couple of minutes. When you tap the screen, a little meter is going to pop up over here, a little pink heart. Tap, 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 tap until it gets all the way to the very end. When it gets to the end, it's going to throw you a party. When you do that, it tosses my content out to the For You page and shows it to people who maybe have never seen it before, where they can find out that I teach upholstery workshops, both in person mm -hmm. and virtual. Mm -hmm. I have virtual upholstery camps. My husband is sending me kisses. Um, text message because I think he's watching so when you are tapping the like button in this if you're not asking questions or you're not sharing it it's sending my stuff out it's giving me engagement it's telling people that it's relevant to the kind of stuff that you want to learn and it helps people find me so I'm going to tell you a little bit about me while you guys are tapping violently at the screen let me just get my stuff verified to continue oh Oh, it made me stop my live to verify that I was still here. So, I have a dresser set that I need to repair, and I want to change any advice. Uh, yeah, if you join my local upholstery club, even though it's not an upholstery-related question, you can make your post in there, and not only will you get advice from me, but you'll get advice from all my friends, too, which is really nice. Okay, so... Um, when you guys are tapping like, it's way more valuable to me than sending me gifts. I appreciate the gifts, but the tap, tap, tapping likes, is uh, it actually drives people to spend money on my website. So that's what I'm looking to do. So my name is Kim. Uh, the company that I run here is called Loco. I teach upholstery workshops. I teach in-person upholstery workshops here at my local makerspace called MakerWorks. It's in Ann Arbor, Michigan. A makerspace is basically like having a gym membership, but for tools. So it's a 14,000 square foot space. I pay a monthly membership to access the rooms and the tools in this space so I can come work on my projects whenever I want. I don't have to even own any tools for myself because they have everything I need here. And most makerspaces are run the same way. So I teach my classes four days a week. I have five classes that I teach four days a week here out of this makerspace. Four are in person, so you can come visit me. It's Friday evenings from 6 to 9, Saturday mornings from 10 to 1, Sunday mornings from 10 to 1, and Monday mornings from 10 to 1. So those are my in-person classes. If you're coming to visit, you can come for a whole weekend, take four days straight in a row. I can find a cool place for you to stay out here. There's plenty of them. Um, and then you can take all those classes straight. My classes are all buy three, get one free, whether you're taking virtual upholstery classes or um, in-person some classes so you can buy three of them get them for the price of or buy four of them get them for the price of three if you're coming for a weekend that's 225 bucks for a four-day upholstery weekend plus whatever the cost of your hotel stay is and there's some great bed and breakfast out here where I'm good friends with the people who run them so I have some really great places for you to stay if you come out here one of the things that I'm trying to do is I had, last year I taught three weekend upholstery retreats here locally, and we stayed at a local bed and breakfast, and then we came here to work during the day. Uh, a lot of people are always like, oh, I wish you would live closer to me. So this year I'm actually looking for maker spaces all over the United States interested in hosting my classes. If you can find a maker space near you interested in hosting me for a weekend, and you make that connection, and I sign that deal with that person, and I come out there and teach these classes at the maker space, you will get that weekend upholstery camp for free. You'll get to attend that for free just for making the connection. So if you're interested in learning this and you want to bring me to your area, look for a local maker space near you. Contact them. Tell them about me. There's a link in my bio called Weekend Upholstery Camps. Send them to that link. It'll give them all the information they need. They can reach out and contact me. Let me know that you're the one that sent them. Plus, if we have multiple people calling maker spaces telling them they want upholstery workshops, chances are they're going to find me too. So there's not a lot of people doing this. I do in-person workshops, but I do live or live virtual workshops too. Monday evenings from 6 to 9, I have a group class. 
up to six people can join me on a Zoom. I have a 4K camera, so everything you see from me is in high def. You're going to see my face of me explaining things, and I have another device on my hands where you can see my hands working to help you through your project. So you bring your own project to that Zoom, and I help you through every step of the way. Same way my in-person classes work. You bring your project, and I help you through step by step. You can take one class. You can take... 10 classes, you can take as many classes as you like. It's not curriculum based, it's based on working at your own pace. So you can come and go as you please and work at your own pace. I'm just going through to see if there's any, tell us about your organization. So that's what I'm telling you about Loco. I teach upholstery workshops. So I was a furniture um, refinisher and fabricator for the better part of a decade. My husband and I ran our own fab shop and we made our own furniture and fixtures, design stuff. We also restored a lot of furniture and fixtures. We worked with top architects, designers, and contractors in the Detroit area. And we changed the landscape of restaurants and commercial spaces and just in Detroit, in Ann Arbor, in Ypsilanti, like all over Washtenaw County, Oakland County areas. Uh, we did that for the better part of a decade and we we closed our business two years ago because we were burnt out. It was just my husband and I. We were working seven days a week, 15 hour days, and it was just too difficult to keep going after that long. We couldn't hire anybody because nobody knew how to do what it was we do, and there's no formal training for upholstery. Uh, you can get formal training for welding and woodworking, but where we really needed help was in the upholstery arena because that was where our highest demand was. So I found it really difficult to hire anybody. I couldn't train anybody because I was working in production at the time. Everybody I brought in to train wasn't serious enough to stick around and I couldn't um, like it it set me back it cost me money so it took longer to finish the projects cost me money when they would make mistakes so it was really difficult for me to train while in production after we closed our business I decided I wanted to teach as many people how to do upholstery as possible because I myself would like to do this again in the future for a living professionally. My dream is to open up like a tattoo shop for furniture where you can pick a piece off the wall, pick a fabric, pick an artist, and have them redo your piece. Like that's where I would like to go with it. It's a more creative direction than I was working before. Um, so what I decided to do was teach upholstery workshops. When we moved here to Ann Arbor, I didn't know there was a makerspace here. Someone pointed me in the direction, and I found out that they had empty rooms that I could rent out. Um, that actually came with my membership, so if I was paying a monthly membership, I had access to these rooms that I can reserve for, to teach my classes. I can reserve these rooms to work on my projects. I can use the wood shop. I can use the metal shop. I can use any of the tools that they have here to work on stuff. If I had known a place like this existed when I started my business, I never would have got into a brick and mortar. I would have just been working out of a makerspace because there's no overhead. My monthly payment, the highest end membership at this makerspace is $220 a month and that's keys to the shop. So I can come in 24 hours a day anytime I want, work on my projects whenever I want. It's good if you like to have a nine to five and you want to come in after hours when there's nobody there and have full access to 14,000 square feet of wood shop, metal shop, textiles area, 3D printers, laser cutters, anything you can possibly imagine. It's a really, really cool place. Where are you located? I'm located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So you can come here or I do virtual upholstery workshops, live in-person ones, private ones, or you can come to my Monday night classes, um, or you can try and connect me with a local makerspace and I'll come to you this spring and summer. I would love to connect you to my makerspace. Jillian, I would love for you to do that. My name is Kim, so you can shoot them to the direction of the link in my bio that says weekend upholstery camps. That has all the information that they're going to need there. Uh, again, located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So cool. So glad to have found you. I'm so glad that you found me too, PJ. Thank you for being here. I don't see a camp link to forward to my makerspace. There should be a link that says weekend camp, but if you go to loco.co uh, in the menu, there's a link to that too. And I'm going to have to go through and check my link tree and make sure everything is up to date. Perfect. Find the classes link. Fantastic. Any link that takes you to my website, you should be able to go through the menu and find the weekend camp there too. So you amazing people have got me up to 47.7 thousand likes. I'm going to hang out here until it gets to 50 thousand likes, answer any more questions that you guys have. So if you can, just for a couple more minutes, or not even minutes, it's probably going to take 30 seconds. Tap, 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 until you can get that meter to throw you a party. We're we'll going to see if we get up to 50 thousand. And I'm going to step away so you guys can take a look at all the work that we did today day to give you an idea of what it looked like before we have the other chair.
so this is where we started today this is what the chair looked like when we got started and this is all the work that we did today we did such a good job so we got a lot done and if you stuck around for it you got to learn how to put on ooh, If you stuck around for the whole tutor tutorial, you got to learn how to put the barrier fabric over top of the springs to prevent the springs from cutting through the foam. You learned how to measure and cut for foam to glue it to the surface of the piece. We learned how to trim that off with an electric bread knife so that we could make it look nice and sculpted. And then we learned how to measure and cut the batting, which is the same way we're going to do the fabric, and how to wrap and staple that around the piece. So we did learn a lot today. We're almost to 50,000 likes. We've got just a couple of seconds left. You guys can do it. I really believe in you. Just tap, 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 tap. If there's any other questions, go ahead and put them in. Um, the comments again. My name is Kim. I teach upholstery workshops in person and uh, virtual. Debster says, Kim, what weight is the batting? So this batting is actually from Joanne Fabrics because I ran out of batting uh, from one of my classes. So the batting that I typically use is called Light Bond and it's three quarter inches thick. This batting is a half inch thick. It's not as heavy duty, so it's like thinner and it falls apart fa faster, but it's perfect for what it is we're using. Batting itself just provides a layer of air between your fabric and your foam, so it makes it look a little bit more plush. I'm also gonna put a piece of cotton batting on the surface of this too to make it look nice and plush and like beautiful. So, um, so I, this is like a half inch batting from um, Joy and Fabrics. They have it on the roll in like a big 54 inch bolt, but they also have it in packages. This one came from the packages and it doesn't say half inch, it says high pile. So the high pile batting at Joy and Fabrics or the half inch batting on the bolt would be good if you can't get it. But I do, um, I do sell this material on my website. I sell professional upholstery supplies on my website. You can get foam, you can get batting, you can get jute, you can get staples, you can get tools. You can get buttons, you can get decorative mail heads, threads, everything you need. You get it from my professional upholstery supplier at a little bit of a discount. And anything, any order over $100 is free shipping. So it is at a discount in their professional upholstery supplies and you don't need a business or an EIN number to order. You order it just like you're ordering anything off the internet. Sylvia says, you're amazing. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That's very kind of you. Um, do couches typically require sewing? So you can do just about any upholstery project without sewing, potentially. Um, but what I will say is if you're looking to have like removable cushions, you're going to have to sew at some point. So if you're doing a couch that you need a removable cushion, you are going to be sewing. But sewing is not hard to learn, I promise you, especially for upholstery. There's not a lot of like um, tricks or quilting or anything fancy, mostly just straight lines. So I can teach you how to sew a straight line, no big deal. We can do that in a virtual upholstery class or you can come into class and I'll show you. We did it, you guys. We made it past 52,000 likes. I really appreciate your help. I'm done for the day. I gotta get this mess cleaned up because they have another class in here after me. But I really appreciate you guys joining me. I think we got a lot of work done. This chair is a chair that I'm refinishing for the New Year New Chair Challenge that I'm doing with Madam of Making on Instagram. Me and about almost a dozen other upholsterers are getting in on this challenge where we're all gonna be working on a piece. This is the piece I'm working on. I have two of these actually. It's actually a set of six chairs, but two that look just like this that I'm doing um, with specialized fabric that you guys will be able to watch throughout this challenge. My video is going up on January 22nd. I wish, you could sh I, wish I could show you this old chair frame and get ideas on how to start reupholstering it. You can! I have a private group on Facebook called the Lull Co Upholstery Club, and there is a link to that in my bio. I think it says join the club. Um, you can join that private group. It's free. You can post pictures and videos of your projects. If you get stuck, if you have a question, or if you just want to show me something cool or you need support from a lot of cool people, you can make a post in there, tag me in it. And there are people there from every walk of life, every level of upholstery experience, from looky-loos to people who have been doing it for 50 years. So, And everybody in there is extremely supportive. Nobody in there is going to hate on you because you're teaching yourself. A lot of us are self-taught. 
most upholsterers are self-taught because there's no trade schools for them out here and there haven't been for a long time. So my group is actually a really supportive group that is a mixture of professionals and DIYers that are all there to help you do the same thing, which is learn how to do upholstery to help us keep up with the demand because that's what we need. We need more skilled trades people. So I hope you join the group. I do have to approve you to get in, so that's no big deal. After I get off of here, I'll go through and approve everyone who comes through. Um, if you have any problems with that, you can email me. My email is also in the link in my bio. So reach out and contact me for anything you need. I'm here live on Tuesdays for Tutorial Tuesdays, working through whatever project I'm doing. So you can learn upholstery from me for free there. If you have something specific that you'd like to learn, you can book a private virtual upholstery lesson with me. We can work through like one-off skills or work through a whole entire project but I also do virtual upholstery lessons on Monday evenings right now from 6 to 9 p.m. Once interest picks up I'll add more days but for right now I just do the group classes on Monday evenings it's 75 bucks for a three-hour class and I walk you through step by step for your project so we've already got those started this month and we're gonna keep going my schedule for January and February is up if you're interested in taking a class you can get on my website and you can sign up for it there I've got to shut this down because i got to clean this room for the next class, but I really appreciate you guys joining me today. I appreciate all the likes. I appreciate you joining the group, and I hope I get to hear from more of you soon. We'll talk to you later.